from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Okay, we're rolling. Okay. Good afternoon. Today is August 15th, 2013. Speaking is David Klein from the History Department at Virginia Tech. Uh, also working with the Southern Oral History Program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We are conducting an interview today for the Civil Rights History Project of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Behind the camera is John Bishop of Media Generation, and we have the honor today of interviewing John and Jean Rosenberg. Uh, Jean is on Channel 1, and John is on Channel 2, and I just want to thank you both very much for being part of this. Project. Glad to be here. And we'll start today um, with, we'll get start with Jean. I okay. just wanted to, I, I usually start with people's family backgrounds in, in the belief, and maybe you'll prove me wrong, but that often the way that people are raised and the, the I, ideals and the, the influence, um, you can see later in wh where, what a person ends up doing. And so I'm curious, I'm always curious about the family life of people as, as they, um, uh, are raised. So if you could tell us a little bit about your background okay. and whether you see any of those kind of Oh, absolutely. Forces. I mean, okay. I think that's yeah. absolutely true in my observation okay. of life, too. So I was um, born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and adopted by a transplanted New York couple. And my father, having been uprooted from his Presbyterian uh, community, was looking for a place uh, to uh, a spiritual for spiritual growth and connected with the Quakers and subsequently <laughs> we uh, he joined and I joined and then later my brother and my mother joined the Quaker meeting in Abington Pennsylvania and that led to uh, uh, an intense exposure to um, social action mm -hmm. and commitment to the idea that there's that of God in every person and that, and also to um, the fact that people uh, can arrive at decision making by consensus, and I think that that's a very um, uh, important element in in my later years. That was a very good background for me to be living here in Appalachia. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I went from there. I went. Were there particular? Projects or focus, social justice focus in that of that meeting. Or oh well, of that meeting, obviously, uh, that meeting and the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting mm -hmm. were always involved in uh, racial issues, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, definitely mm -hmm. in war uh, concern concern about peace, the peace process, and how to accomplish accomplish that. Mm -hmm. So I was always involved in those that Young Friends movement as growing up and it, it guided me to apply to Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana, which is a Quaker school. And then I graduated there in uh, June of nineteen sixty five. Okay. And you were born in well, what year? I was born in forty three. Well you worked in you went to a summer work camp in Mexico or right, right, sure, but yeah. That sort of thing. And your mom was on the picket line for peace, right? Right. That's what Witness for Peace, the good old women. Witness so let's hear a little bit. No, I mean, well, I mean, it's just a, yeah. a part and parcel yeah. of my growing yeah. up years. Yeah. And I, in my high school at Abington High School, mm -hmm. which is a suburban Philadelphia high school, uh, refused to take part in air raid drills as I felt that it was a psychology of uh, fear and terror and that and that in fact and in truth hiding under your desk was not going to help you <laughs> in a Cold War situation. <laughs> and therefore I uh, refused. And so I was um, taken to the uh, principal's office and um, called a communist dupe. Mm -hmm. And uh, then play, I was directed that when we had the drill I was to sit in front of the plate glass window so I'd be the first to be killed. <laughs> oh my so, uh, you know, that, when people do that, when they take those kinds of positions, then you are, you know, you're more, even more committed to thinking about what it is you're doing and why. And um, so I was able to arrange for a, a film called Operation Correction to go along. It was a, 
I, this is going on and no, on. No, so, no, no. But, 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 you know, I mean, I arranged for that to be shown in my high school just so that people could see that there was another side to the story. And I felt that was very important. This is the second day in a row that Operation Correction has been mentioned. So it's really? Interesting. Yeah. Um, a, a, where was he? It was a, a minister that showed it in his community and got run out of town for showing. Well, yeah. you know, yeah. I, luckily I was an honor student. So, uh, you know, I, I think I got more leeway <laughs> mm. because I was, uh, mm -hmm. was able to do well on tests. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and you started college in 1961. Um, at Wilmington College. I did not go to Earlham initially. I, went and I waited too long to apply, mm -hmm. and so uh, I had the offer of waiting out a year and coming with the next class or... Or uh, and I I went to Wilmington College, which is in Richmond, uh, which is in Wilmington, Ohio, mm -hmm. which is another Quaker school, and then I transferred in my junior year. Okay. So and having been raised in the family and in the community that, that you've been telling us about, uh, with a lot of awareness of um, of issues, social issues and justice issues. Um, how aware we, were you of other things that were happening in the country and the, what we was I, to talk I was about the civil rights movement? But were you aware of earlier traditions and and or what was going on? You know, were there particular well, moments I mean, for you? Well, uh, I mean, I was very aware of of uh, the Vietnam War mm -hmm. and the lead up to that, mm -hmm. and uh, I was one of the protesters. At my, at Earlham, mm -hmm. you know, that would go regularly to stand and witness mm -hmm. against the war, uh, and uh, it was. Uh, however, my friend Dorothy, we referred to her as Landsberg. She was Dorothy Shelton then. I met her at Earlham College, and she was involved with. Um, her father was an internal revenue lawyer in Washington, D.C., and he helped get her a summer internship with John Doerr in the summer of 64, where she, she worked very hard on the, um, developing a, an index of, uh, from the FBI reports on Klan members, which was then subsequently helpful when jury selection took place in a number of the mm -hmm. cases. And is that how you? And, well, I mean, it? we were. I mean, we were all. She was. She was part of the student, act, you know, act, political activities committee, and so was I. But you met John, right? And then I met John Doerr. That's when I met John Doerr. He, she invited him to speak at a convocation at Earlham, okay. and he, uh, she didn't want to introduce him because she was afraid he would tease her in front of everyone. <laughs> so <laughs> she got her buddy Gene to introduce him, and while we were eating together. Uh, he said, well, have you ever thought about joining the establishment? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, why don't, you, why don't you do that? And uh, why don't you give it a try? And so since I wasn't focused on where I would be after I graduated, we had thought about going to law school, but uh, that wasn't really a passion. So um, I did, in fact, uh, apply and was accepted uh, with... Uh, as a research analyst for the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice in June of 65. Okay. And I then went on to qualify my loyalty oath, and I still had the job. <laughs> mm. and, and what did you say? I inserted uh, in the loyalty oath that I, I would, insofar as my conscience would allow, I would def you know, support and defend the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, they kept me <laughs> anyway. And that was when... Um, I started working as a research analyst mm -hmm. and went from, uh, we worked on all kinds of cases. We worked on, on uh, school desegregation cases, police brutality cases, employment cases during the time that I was there. I, I left in the uh, spring of 1970. So let's switch over to John, and then we'll bring him up to that, that same moment. <laughs> so, uh, John, if you could introduce yourself and uh, a little bit about your background as well, would be wonderful. 
Well, I'm John Rosenberg. I'm Jean's husband of 46 years. She's put up with me over that period, hopefully for another, maybe not 46, but a few more. Uh, I was born in Germany, October 7, 1931, a long time ago. Um, my father was a teacher in the Jewish school system. I say the Jewish school system. He actually, when Adolf Hitler set up a seg required the schools to be segregated so that Jewish kids were separated out, he and another man established, set up the school for Jewish kids, and the city was named Magdeburg, Germany, a city then of about 300,000 people, a large industrial center which was bombed pretty heavily during the war. And I grew up there, and in the, you know, as a uh, young child, the first day of school is a big deal. And if I remember right, you go to school, start around Easter, and they give you a big conical bag with all kinds of gifts in it. I say that because we have, there's a family picture of me holding this conical bag with our gifts on the first day of school. But I was actually, by that point, in my father's class. Um, he was, uh, we, he was a teacher and then also worked for the Jewish Welfare Agency. He was teaching courses to people who were interested in going to Israel. He wanted to go to Israel, but my mother said, no, we are, if we leave the country, we're going to go to the United States because her mother and father and two sisters had emigrated to the country and she wasn't really interested in going to Israel. Um, although he had had one sister and a brother go to Israel at an early time as uh, into a small uh, cooperative community. In any event, um, we lived in a building next to a synagogue. We had an apartment there because Dad worked for that welfare agency and he also assisted the rabbi in the local congregation. So we were there during Kristallnacht and they bombed the synagogue. They didn't, uh, they were somewhat careful about the synagogue because there was a hospital ne next door. Otherwise, as you probably know, all the other synagogues primarily were burned down or the ones, most synagogues in Germany were burned. Anyway, we, my dad was in a concentration camp for 11 days, and we were fortunate enough to get out of the country. It was a, and so we came, we spent a year in Holland. My father uh, started a school in this detention camp, and uh, we and had no materials, but he taught by the Socratic method, teaching us verbally. Um, and so we came to this country on February 22, 1940, 40 on pretty much the last ship. His brother and mother were on, were on board, I'm not sure about his mother, I think both, of another ship of several weeks later and the ship was required, it was turned around because a war had started. So they didn't get out. So he, his brother was killed, he lost, the, the, we, there was another family, one of his sisters had married fellow who was on a stock exchange who was, they were fairly well off, they had five kids in Rotterdam, and uh, that family was gone, and uh, family in Germany, uh, most of his, I think it's, so he lost I think a substantial, it's and, his, and his mother was also uh, killed during that period. She, she lived right very close to the end of the war. In fact, his brother married in the, during the, while he was in the concentration camp, and we met his widow in Israel several years later. But um, so we came and then we, the, my father, when we came to this country, there, it was very difficult to find a job. There were so many immigrants in New York. And so he learned of a uh, community in Spartanburg, South Carolina and Gastonia, North Carolina. Didn't have, they had substantial Jewish communities, but no rabbi. And so he, that's what, drew him there. I'm not, we always, I'm not sure which comes first, but during the week he swept floors in a textile mill mm -hmm. and on weekends he alternated going to these two communities and I always thought it was pretty amazing because he was writing sermons when he could hardly, just still learning to speak English. Mm -hmm. But uh, after three years we then moved, he learned of a better position in a textile mill in Gastonia or in Lowell, North Carolina a fellow who came from our hometown who in Magdeburg apparently who had a mill there, brought a bunch of equipment open, started textile mill. Daddy learned 
uh, went to work as an office manager, if I remember right, but he basically learned the textile business and stayed as a white collar worker and was very active in the local synagogue. And I grew up in the town of Gastonia for practical purposes. We'd been in Spartanburg for three years. So I grew up in Gastonia and, uh, you know, worked after school and scouting was a big part of my life. I was an Eagle Scout and uh, spent summers as a counselor and went off to Duke University as a freshman. Uh, May I ask what the, what would the racial dynamics were in Gastonia at that time? Well, about which first tell about the fact that being a Jew, being a German immigrant, they took away the binoculars. I just think that's a interesting caveat. Oh, my, the, uh, after the war started, when you were, we were aliens, yeah. not yet, my parents weren't citizens, and Gene yeah. always thinks, the FBI or Treasury agents came to our apartment one day, knocked on the door, and they required, they took the binoculars that my parents had and the shortwave, the radio that had a capability of getting shortwave, and, um, but they were, <clears throat> I guess, they were quite embarrassed to see that we had Franklin Delano Roosevelt's picture on the wall, and, you know, you have this fairly patriotic, thankful family to be in this country, and they came and took this equipment away from us, and it was, I think, Obvious. mutually embarrassing. Very different. They eventually brought, they brought it back, I think, after the war, we got stuff back. But um, we were, uh, Gastonia was a segregated society. It was a segregated, we had black schools, we had you were living in a segregated society. And um, you always think back on those days, the Jewish community, you know, many, most of the members of that community, as was true in many Southern communities, were pretty well off. They, all, they had, their, their parents and grandparents had come to these communities or had come to the area as peddlers and started mm -hmm. selling merchandise and then eventually built a, built, had a, a retail store and so the the uh, communities was well off. I'm not sure that anybody had ever seen a poor, Jew what we were relatively poor Jewish working family <laughs> till we got there. Um, we were. Uh, uh, it was a nice community, and several of the community people were. I think they respected my father a lot because he had it such a huge knowledge of Jewish culture and mm -hmm. could read Hebrew. He could quote the next verse in the Torah for five books of Moses if you started him anywhere in there, which wasn't that unusual for someone who had all that biblical background or had studied in the sem. He had been to the seminary. He actually came from a family with nine children in northwest Germany, and one of his early teaching assignments was in my mother's hometown. So she was a young 16-year-old, and they got to know each other, and by when she was 18, they got married. But... Um, and so he was working, you know, in the mill, and uh, I had summer jobs in the mill, and it was as you, you lived, as you, as you know, every, the Jewish community was thankful to be there economically, and they were never, and even though they couldn't get into the country club for many, even despite their wealth, most of them were not, at that point, the country clubs were segregated. But they certainly took no major initiatives in trying to help integrate the community or call any call attention to the fact that this is wrong. And you grew, I think you basically grew up with it. And when you move into that system, looking back, you're, I'm sure my parents were so grateful to be there that uh, they were, that was the last thing they had in mind. Uh, although my parents, my mother especially, I mean, my summer job, I worked often, you, if, when you're in the mill, you interact with lots of black folks, right. and, uh, but everybody kind of knows where the lines are, and um, I don't know there was any, in Gastonia's history is sort of interesting, there was a book called Preachers and Mill Hands, they had riots in the 20s and 30s around the textile worker issue and working conditions, but it wasn't racial. It wasn't, that was not a, ra a racial issue. Um, when, um, so the schools were totally segregated and that's just the way life was. Mm -hmm. at, 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 mother had, my mom was known to be a very friendly person. She wasn't, didn't start work. She decided after the kids were all gone that she wanted to be 
a saleswoman to do work in the local uh, department store, which she did, but she had people coming by, whether they were black or white, and she would interact with them and offer them a bite to eat or whatever. And uh, I think the family, in that sense, uh, I didn't have, don't recall, I don't think I had any friends in the black community. Uh, a few years ago, not too many years ago, 10 years ago, I think Gastonia, the class president of the year before me, or two years, uh, promoted a joint uh, anniversary of the classes from mm. 1948 so that the black and white graduates would, now being adults, would, mm. would be together. I think it was a one-time thing, um, but uh, I remember that. Gaston County, Gastonia, Gaston County is actually one of the voting rights cases I went to, the, eventually went to the Supreme Court, I think they challenged this, the uh, the mechanism which under which Gaston County was selected. But uh, from then, I was at Duke University. I went to undergraduate school at Duke. It wasn't. It was sort of between Duke and the University of North Carolina. And there was a trustee at the time named C. Park who was from Gastonia, and he encouraged me to go to Duke, and he because he thought he could secure, and he did secure a tuition scholarship for me for the first, for what we hope would be four years. Unfortunately, he died after the first year. And I was then interviewed and said, you're making too much money working in the dining room where you got chips for food or whatever. And they said, we can't keep, you're going to have to pay your own tuition, which I did and stayed in. But it was always sort of, gosh, we, I was pretty poor. My dad was sending me 25 bucks a month or something. And <laughs> they took away the tuition scholarship, but I did get, I was a chem major at Duke and uh, in ROTC, and so I ended, were, went into the United States Air Force, and I spent three years in England as a navigator, mm -hmm. London, very close to a lot of my colleagues, uh, had a very uh, interesting year, fly, we went, at, at that time it was a period of the Cold War, so many of our exercises were on the close to the Russian border, we dropped the special forces and um, a very military period, mm -hmm. <laughs> totally contrary to what I... I was picketing the Pentagon. <laughs> right, while she was picketing the Pentagon. So after I came out of the service, I worked for a year for a chemical firm, Roman Haas in Philadelphia. Let me just ask about the Air Force. Uh, the Air Force was integrated at that point. What, what was your experience? There in terms of well, I, I think it, it, it was integrated, and it was sort of in one of, the, one of the things I relate is there was a pretty much a life-changing experience for me because we were very close to each other, blacks and whites, and we, on one of those occasions, we uh, brought a plane back to this country, and the radar operator was a fellow from Charleston, South Carolina, named Abe Jenkins, and he, when we brought the plane back to Long Island, we went by way of... Iceland and then Greenland. It was a little, it was an SA-16 called a Grumman Albatross, which flies at about 160 miles an hour. So if you've got a very heavy headwind, you might be moving along at 20 or 30 miles an hour over the ground, which on at least one occasion we did because the <laughs> island, we were just about to run out of fuel. Anyway, we got back and we, when we got to Long Island, Abe and I had a week to go home and we got on the train together in New York, when we got to Washington, we were in uniform, and when we got to Washington, uh, Abe said he would see me later, and I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to the back of the train where the blacks are, and I said, and he did, and uh, I thought, this is bad, <laughs> this is really wrong, and maybe, I'm sure in the back of my mind, maybe somewhere uh, along the way, I'll have a chance to help do something about that which uh, um, so you're, you're right, it was a, uh, I mean, and then the sense that I ended up going to Civil War, I'm sure that particular incident had a lot to do with the way, I mean, it sort of hit me in the head. I don't know it was May, whether it was the first trip back when we were together. We, we went, I went through navigation school with many black members, and it never seemed to be. I'm going to cut just for a minute. Yeah. 
That mosquito is coming for me. We'll take little breaks. Okay, we're back. I, it's, uh, it was interesting because in navigation school, my uh, four of us lived together off base, four students, and two of them were from Texas and one was from New Orleans. And it was at a time when people were, we, I think, uh, I don't think I had a, I didn't have a car, but I know that one of them did, and we had this Confederate Air Force sticker on there. And there was still, a f the institution was, in a, as an institution, but there was still a fair amount of racism and joking and that sort of thing, and uh, going on, and it was all uh, part of the way you lived, but you also, I think, we, I think they saw that the members, the black folk, the black uh, officers who were in navigation training at that time, you know, it's, it was their first, everybody's first experience in a major way of living together, working together, and eventually having to depend on each other. So that was just leading up to the time that we were, when I went to England, and then we were, you have crew members and you're in some fairly dangerous situations and you just know for sure that the color of your skin doesn't make any difference at all. <laughs> you're involved in a very difficult exercise in which they're depending on you or you're depending on them as much as you are any other, anybody else. So. And for you personally, I don't know were there, if there were African Americans in your classes at, at Duke. Um, or was this really for you the first time to be in close proximity? It uh, was. I mean, Duke was still a white school. Duke was still segregated. They uh, had a Jewish quota. Yeah, they had a yeah they had a quota for Jewish, which I I don't think I was aware of, in the sense that, you know, you thought well this is the number, but when I went to Duke, the two roommates I had were both Jewish. <laughs> we weren't put there by accident. Um, but there was did, a Jewish did you fraternity. To each other on that was that. Like, did, uh, did you comment to each other about that? When you I don't there? know. You know, it turned out that one of them and I became, were lifelong friends. The other, one of them became a doctor. Norman Rosenbaum went to the University of Virginia and ended up in New England. And he was always Norman was much more of a loner. He played. He was from Norfolk or, and um, had played basketball, but uh, he always went off to study on his own. And uh, then. Marty and I ultimately joined the Jewish fraternity, which was a big new experience for me. I'd never been with a lot of Jews. I was president of my senior class in high school, and uh, just one of the boys, as it were. You know, you felt you were a member of, I don't know, that the Jewishness, I never felt any real religious discrimination I mean, we were always, as Jean said, she was a good, very good student. Um, people, I had a younger brother who did, who was also doing well in school, and I was involved in a lot of activities and always working after school. And, you know, so there was people, I think, did respect the family. And as I say, I was president of my sophomore class and then again my senior class. So, um, I lost my train of thought. Okay, I have one thing yeah. I wanted to say about my history is, interestingly enough, um, when I went to Wilmington College, which is a Quaker school, they were they in, intentionally assigned me a black roommate because they didn't know how the other uh, gals on my hall would respond to, to being integrated mm. in '61. Mm -hmm. So I got the black roommate from the Bronx, and we've been lifelong friends. Right. But it's interesting, she, you know. Uh, sure. I re I How did they know that you would be? Because I was school? a Quaker. Okay, yeah. You know, it wasn't, you know, just because you go to a Quaker school, they're few and far between, usually. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, Very interesting. Be. And she has been. Well, and the, so the three of us, then the, Marty, this other, uh, the third, the two roommates, Marty Sack and I, he became, he recently passed away. He was a lawyer in Jacksonville and he was um, and we became very very close. Uh, as I say I, we both joined the fraternity and the third roommate didn't. Um, he was in, he stayed independent on pretty much on his own and so Marty and I. Uh, but you had this Jewish fraternity 
on campus at Duke, which at that time was only Jewish. I had, after I, my second year, uh, I was a delegate to a national convention in which the charter was changed to allow non-Jewish members, although it's still primarily a Jewish fraternity, I think. Right. But it did expose me to a whole new system. I mean, I the, this it was very helpful to. It was nice. These were were pretty close, and there were very few Jewish women on the East Campus, but they were also integrated. So there was a conscious effort by the administration at that time to keep the number of students down. Of course, today it's. There's, it is, they're multinational, multicultural, multi-religious, a very, very fine institution. But I then went to the, after I worked for the chemical company for a year, I was thinking I wanted to do something that might be a little more useful and maybe use my brain a little bit and decide to go to the, so to the, to law school. And, um, uh, and whether, I really figured out it already that I was going to be in the Civil Rights Division. I'm not sure. Uh, I be, uh, Julius had a fairly small, he was a very, Julius Chambers, who then was number one in our, became number one in our class, had a fairly small circle of non, of uh, white friends mm -hmm. socially, or to the extent that he was going to spend any time uh, not studying. So we did become friendly during those those years at uh, Chapel Hill and kind of kept up with each other over the years. I was kept up sort of with his great his great uh, career and uh, he would we would exchange letters and once in a while we'd see each other at uh, you know at conferences and he'd send a little money to Apple Red when I was over here. So from the after I finished law school I was pretty determined to be in the Civil Rights Division. And uh, that's, uh, I actually spent the first month and a half uh, in the antitrust division waiting to get an interview with John Doerr, who at that time was going down to the University of Mississippi every week too, because it was the time of getting James Meredith into Old Miss, into the University of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And so after I interviewed with John, there were only eight or nine lawyers at that time in the division. Then uh, I was delighted to start. So why civil rights? I mean, you said early on in your law career you saw an interest there. What was it? Well, I mean, I think it was a combination of having been born in Germany and seeing and thinking about the hol this Holocaust history of ours and the, dis the terrible genocide that went, subjected, the, that the Jewish people were throughout Europe were subjected to. And then seeing really in having been to, in the service with people who were black and thinking that this is, the caste system is wrong in this country, being very proud of this country. I mean, I'm still, I think it's the greatest place, finest country in the world, and there's just some things that are we need to keep working on to make it better. And I feel, I felt that this was a place I could make a contribution. It, I thought that maybe as a southerner, to some extent, communication-wise, it's a little easier. Mm -hmm. it, you, that, I don't know that I'd hope to change any, how many people I'd change, whose mind I would change, but it just seemed that the division, which was representing the United States in these cases, and that we would, that you have the force of the country behind you, and that it was going to be, it's going to be, difficult work mm. and uh, challenging work that uh, was just kind of getting underway. The division was created just in 1957 and, and they really didn't have very much authority to do very much itself and the lawyers who had been working sort of as civil rights division lawyers had been sitting at their desks in Washington and were kind of reviewing papers and didn't do it very much mm. till John Doerr came in 1960 with six months to go and Eisenhower administration and realize what you've got to do is go to the South and talk to the people who are having the problems and try to do something. Mm -hmm. And that was, he being a trial lawyer, he said, you got to go find out what the facts are. And so he was working on those. Uh, it was quite a heroic, I thought, for him to take this job with six months to go. He got a call and from the I, nobody else was willing to do it. And so he 
I was actually working on one of these cases in Louisiana where uh, a cotton farmer had registered to vote and the cotton ginners then conspired to refuse to gin his cotton because his guy's name was Charles Atlas, the same as the bodybuilder. And, uh, uh, and so the story goes that Bobby Kennedy, who had become attorney general, was reviewing the pleadings and the affidavits in those cases and saw and had talked with John and realized that this was really a very special person who could get some things done. I think there's a little more to it, he actually. They had a conversation about where things were, and John explained to him by that time during after he was sort of in charge during the transition from one administration to the next. And so Bobby Kennedy asked John to stay on, and, and then he did, and he eventually became also assistant attorney general. But he was in charge of the trial work, and he taught us basically his system of trying cases. And, mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, we can talk if you want to go back to Gene or where, we'll back, how would you we'll want to go do? back and forth. I just want to follow up on that. How how close did how closely did the Attorney General and the and the division work? In this oh, very much so. I mean, I think the Attorney General Bobby Kennedy at that point was the boss, mm -hmm. and he he, um, uh, but he clearly wanted us to when I think. The mission of the division in, at that time in 1962 was really, uh, from a legal standpoint, to, to challenge the voting syst the system of uh, voting discrimination against blacks throughout the South. Now, other things happened, and that was like James Meredith couldn't anticipate the timing of when he was going to go to Ole Miss in 1962, and so uh, protecting him became an issue uh, that took considerable division time. Lawyers were spending the, or my, I don't, I don't know, I gave you his name, Gerald Stern, who is, is another lawyer who's in Washington who actually tried one of the big coal mining cases here uh, a few years ago and wrote a book called The Buffalo Creek Disaster. Um, Gerald, uh, I, while I, I was waiting to see John, uh, John was initially spent all his time with Meredith. I have a really nice picture in him, and I can get of McChain, Marshall McShane, and John uh, with James Meredith being confronted by Lieutenant Governor Johnson when they weren't going to admit him. It's we might want to mm -hmm. put in yeah. here. Yeah. Um, is that in the stack next to you, or is that somewhere else? No, it's not in here. It's up on my wall in oh, the other okay. room. I have to bring it down. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, the, uh, you know, after Reconstruction, blacks were basically prohibited from voting. I mean, they wiped the rolls clean in most of these counties, in these rural counties, Mississippi and Alabama, and I was assigned. Initially, I went to, was, I spent a short amount of time in Georgia. There had been a series of church burnings, and, I mean, this uh, efforts to... Uh, protest, the failure to let people register to vote were going on all over in these various states. We were assigned geographically and the first few months I was in Georgia working with a lawyer named Jerry Heilbrunn who had practiced in Fort Smith, Arkansas for many years, was one of the few private attorneys who had actually, few lawyers who were private attorneys, but who when the racial issues started coming up was viewed as a liberal and they basically lost all his business and Burke Marshall heard about it and they connected and he came up and spent some time, eventually went to the community relations service. Jerry was sort of a glad hander but a, a, a very liberal in his thinking and wanted to do something about racial discrimination. So I worked with Jerry for a little while and then we actually, one of our very first cases with not a very good outcome, a deputy sheriff in Sasser, Georgia, which is near Americas in that yeah. uh, very difficult area, you know the area. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, had there were three or four black students who had gone from door to door to register people to vote, and he chased them out of town with a pistol. Yeah. And um, so we filed a criminal information, and uh, we had a trial in federal court, and we need to. 
when you stop. Anyway, mm -hmm. the jury wasn't out very long, but it was my first case mm -hmm. with, uh, to put on some witnesses and... Uh, How difficult was it to get witnesses? And Dime? Van Hoffman. Van Hoffman. The post, oh, right? Yes, I remember. <laughs> yeah, much more of somebody. I'm, um, I was always dodging him. Okay. <laughs> well, 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 no, I'm that. not going to tell you that. Yeah, no, well, 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 <clears throat> okay, so where are we? we oh, you were asking, we were talking about yeah. the, uh, this was my first experience in a federal criminal prosecution with the uh, deputy sheriff. Mm -hmm. The jury wasn't out terribly long. Um, oh, that's right. I was about, just about to ask how difficult it was to find people willing to, to testify. So well, this in this case, the major witnesses were these black students who had been affected. Okay. And um, interesting sidelight, although I always thought a lot of Jerry uh, Heilbrunn was that um, he had he was late getting getting there. I think a plane was late, so. Uh, the judge was not wanted to start the case, so I actually examined the witnesses and uh, the early witnesses before we got to the cross examination of the deputy, which was after that Jerry was going to do it. But I had call, was calling these witnesses, these black students, by their last names, Mr. Mrs. Mr. Mrs. And so um, he, I could see from looking around, this was people were thought that was pretty unusual, and I'm not sure that even Jerry agreed with it <clears throat> a little later. I don't recall later whether he, in his summation, referred to them by their first names. He was still of the view, I think, that we could persuade Southerners to comply, because even coming from his community in Fort Smith, I think he felt bad about leaving it, you know, you kind of that. So he was still trying to sort of, well, if we, if we're going to be a little more Southern about the way, if we under, if we're more, they'll understand us, maybe we can make things happen in a consensual way, as the Quakers would say. Uh, I think the Klan wasn't about to do that, <laughs> and many others weren't about to do it. But then, uh, from then, I was transferred over to Mississippi in 19, towards the end of '62 and the beginning of 1963. And um, but the answer to your question is, I think, well, it was in that case the three black students were willing to testify. I think it was always took a lot of courage. Mm -hmm. Whether were they, they were local or were they coming in? From they the were local. Place? These okay. three students that had been chased away, I think. That were from another community because mm -hmm. he chased them out of town. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the details of it, but they were, th um, I think all three of them were black, and I think they'd been recruited by SNCC or one of the groups from Albany. They may have been part of the Albany. There was a large movement in Albany, sure. and I went to Albany several times during, I, I'm just vague on that memory because I spent a little time there, but C.B. King was a minister who I had spoken, had gone to and met with several times and trying to, our, what we were trying to do was be prepared in the event to get information back to the Attorney General's office or the Civil Rights Division about what was happening in these communities. We didn't have any success really I'm not in the Georgia church burnings. I think that was those were among the first things that were events and they were at night and there were going to those witnesses you would have had to have some uh, way into the white community or into the Klan or whoever did that those shootings and burnings. Um, we got better at it, I think as time went on. The FBI got better with it as time went on uh, as after the civil, after the three civil rights workers were murdered, especially, um, but then I went to Missis. Then I was moved over to the Mississippi section. And um, how, how did um, monitoring work? Of because blacks should have been allowed to register to vote, but often had problems. How were those kinds of things monitored? Well, the way um, you know, initially when the the early the first efforts to register in a, uh, were 
uh, in most of these counties, the only people who were registered was the funeral, the black funeral director, maybe one or two teachers, people who were sort of up a little higher, who were well off, and uh, but if uh, but then SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and Southern Christian Leadership Conference, primarily SNCC, I think, decided that they wanted to start a major effort. And then they started in about 1961, before I came to the division. And Bob Moses was the person who was given charge of Mississippi. And even before I came, he had been beaten in a Mitt County at one point, and the Civil Rights Division had brought one of their first cases to stop. They were going to prosecute Bob for resisting arrest or for interfering with us. Uh, police officer and normally a federal court does not get involved in state criminal cases wouldn't stop something like that because the old his the old law was that you let you can appeal a criminal case you don't interfere with the state but that was one of the first cases the division brought to stop these police officers to stop that prosecution from going forward so Bob Moses then came to Greenwood and moved this, they started a major initiative in LaFleur County to get people to register. And um, uh, he and seven or eight other SNCC uh, members who were encouraging people to go up and register uh, were arrested and put in jail and the division filed a lawsuit against the state of, against LaFleur County officials for, inter, for their interference with these efforts to, to register people to vote under the federal, under, um, federal law. And so um, one of my first trips to Greenwood was there was a negotiated settlement which John and some officials carried out and I remember going to the police station and getting those people out, of, getting Bob and a group of people out of jail. And um, it was a very courageous thing for any individual to go register who was black. I mean, they were likely to lose their job. They were, people knew who they were, especially in the more, even the more rural counties. But in Mississippi, I think there's a picture here of a, of a group going up to the Greenwood steps. If you're, if you wanted to see it, I don't know whether it tells you anything more, but these local officials were going to arrest these, were going to do everything they could to, um, I don't know if the camera's still rolling, I know they I showed it to you a while ago, here, I think, yeah, the, I think this is a picture of blacks after, I think after the they let the SNCC kids out of jail. They uh, came up, they were not going to interfere with, huh? Yeah, hold it like Do you want to hold it? Yeah. Okay. And that's exactly well, what. So, well, basically what, <clears throat> What we would do would be to try to find, we would go to these counties, locate the leaders in the community, and try to identify those blacks who had gone to register or tried to go register. Oftentimes they'd go up there and they'd say, the register, you've got to see the registrar himself or herself. She's gone. When will she be back? Well, they'd leave, they'd leave work or, and they'd try maybe one or two more times and that was it. The truth was they'd register people over the phone if they were white. Or as John used to say, if they, if they lived and breathed, you could, register, you could vote. But if you were black, you were out. Mm -hmm. So... Would they apply literacy tests or things Well, like that, that, that was the, uh, the ones who got there, who were able to get in, were then given a section of the Constitution that they had to be able to read and write and interpret. And so the whole, all this litigation in all these states before federal judges basically involved the uh, administration of the literacy test. And we 
produced records. Uh, we would produce, the, we'd have the FBI go out. Well, with the FBI then, and we would find the people, if we could, who had attempted to register who were black. Then we'd get the FBI to go with us into a registrar's office, and we would photograph, or the FBI would photograph under our supervision, all the voting records in that office. Then we would take them back to Washington, and you could see on these records, some of these people couldn't write at all. That they were, we would try to identify those that were clearly illiterate, or people you would see that numbers of people gave the same interpretation. There's a, there's a provision in almost every constitution that says you can't, that uh, there shall be no imprisonment for debt. You can't put a prisoner, well, they would say you can't put somebody in for dying death. I mean, there would be all sorts of totally incomprehensible interpretations by white people. Um, there'd be blanks. They would be, there would be a requirement under the citizenship test that you sign your name in a certain place or something, some which, would, which they would not require white people to do. I mean, it was just totally off. So the first major case in which this was stopped, basically, was in front of Judge Johnson in Montgomery, Alabama in the Macon County, Alabama, and Judge Johnson ruled that you had to apply, they had to apply the same standards to blacks that they did for whites. So if you didn't require a white person to interpret the Constitution or correctly, you're no longer going to have to do that. It was called the freezing principle, that the standard is frozen where it is applied to whites. Now, not all the other judges. Judge Johnson was really a beacon. He stood by him. He was probably the only federal judge for many years at the trial level. They had to protect him for these very fair, <laughs> very strong orders that he issued in all these cases. Um, but in Mississippi, we had Judge Cox in Jackson, on in most of the cases in the Southern District, Judge Cox had been Judge uh, Senator Eastland's roommate, I think. He was an avowed segregationist. And he would just put all sorts of roadblocks in your way. And we would try to get a motion heard to photograph records. It would took two or three years to litigate that motion. He would say the statute didn't mean what it said. Mm -hmm. So those cases proceeded very slowly and he would we would have to appeal every order. And contrary to Judge Johnson, Judge Johnson, he might say, oh, this is discrimination against this person. I'm going to order you register these five people. I mean, it just went. So then we also filed the government and civil rights division under, with John. F and there were two other, three other sectional leaders, David Norman, who was uh, from had gone to California to law school, who was probably eighty percent blind. I don't know that. Couldn't see. But... He had a monocular. He could. Mm -hmm. He was a remarkable person, a remarkable lawyer, that we could talk about for a long time. And Bob Owen, who ran the Mississippi section, who came from Texas, and a fellow named um, Frank Dunbaugh, who was in charge of Louisiana. Anyway, David. Uh, came up with the theory that we should sue the state of Louisiana across the board, and we sued, we brought... Can I interrupt just for a second? So within the division, you had uh, regional focuses. Right. We were all assigned, we were all geographical. Okay. So initially, David, yeah, yeah initially, uh, Bob Owen had Mississippi and um, what other places? We Well, me, I think initially he just had Mississippi, and David had Louisiana, and I was trying to think, who was Alabama? See, Frank had Alabama when I was in Well, Frank would, that's, I guess Frank had Alabama, and Dave Norman had Louisiana. Those were the three. Him. And then it was Georgia. And I worked for Dave, initially worked for Bob Owen in Mississippi. And so then he assigned us by counties. So I was responsible for LaFleur County and Greenwood, and then ended up 
also with Jackson and several other counties in Mississippi. We would, I mean, we couldn't possibly do everything, but like in Greenwood, had a voting case to a public, and after the Civil Rights Act of 64, several public accommodation cases. And police brutality uh, cases. Police, there was the, yeah, and we can talk about the cases. That's where Med, where the fellow who shot Medgar mm -hmm. Evers is mm -hmm. from. So how uh, many attorneys... And researchers were in the division. How large was the division? Well, when I came, I think there were 10 lawyers or 12. Responsible for there, every possible For case. everything. For the country. For the country, yeah. And now, but it got larger as we grew. When we had our second, when our recent Civil Rights Division reunion last year, there were 400. Mm -hmm. Now, they have many more areas of responsibility. But we did grow, I think, in Mississippi... Um, I mean, it probably doubled or tripled while we were there. The joke was when you asked me about Bobby Kennedy initially, and he asked John Doerr and uh, Burke what the plan was early on after he was in office. And he said, we want to, the plan was we want to file one action in a significant county in every state, for example. And he said, well, we have to do we can't, we've got to do more than that, or one in each judicial district. I forgot exactly what they wrote. John has it in a book, in a note that he's written. Um, and he said, we've got to have more lawyers. And, and Bobby Kennedy said, well, how many do you need? And Burke Marshall said, four. <laughs> <laughs> we needed, he thought that would be great if we could get four more lawyers. The problem was that the chairman of the Judiciary Committee was Eastland. I mean, it was these congressional committees were run by Southerners, and to think that you're going to get 30 lawyers or anything, it was mm -hmm. crazy. So, and how, uh, Jean, how many researchers were there when you got there in 65? See, I think there were, preceding me, there were maybe three, and then one left right away, and then all together, we probably see. It's hard. It's hard because you were sixty-five. You were. We didn't meet like that. We right. were on. We were assigned uh, different areas, and we. Uh, but I think that would probably fifteen. Well, after the so the big expansion came after the Civil Rights Act of nineteen sixty-four, okay. because the division then was responsible. Up to 1964, the only authority we had was to do voting cases and police brutality cases or conspiracy cases like the civil rights workers case, right. the Liuzu case. But after... Uh, so I was going to ask about that, so let's, let's do that now and uh, we'll talk about some specific cases. But I, I was just going to ask the question, how did the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act change the work that you did in the, in the division? And well, from the first, the first, uh, from 19, until 1964, when I came in 62 and 63, uh, virtually everything we did revolved around this effort, the SNCC effort and the other efforts to get reg people to register to vote. And so in almost every county we went to, we would have these incidents. We had the incident with Fannie Lou Hamer, if you remember, she and four or five other voting, other uh, workers, of course she was from Rouville herself, they were Mississippians, uh, came, had been to a workshop on voter registration and stopped, the bus stopped in Winona, Mississippi in Montgomery County and they got off the bus and went to a lunch counter to get something to eat and they were then arrested even though the Interstate Commerce Commission had desegregated all those so they were arrested, taken to jail, beaten and uh, for no reason at all. And so we filed, that was I think in March of 63, and so we filed a case, a criminal information against the police officers. Mm -hmm. And in sept it was filed, I believe, in September, and the trial was in December. But we had to, it was a good example of the FBI didn't really like investigating these cases because they, most of those agents grew up in that area. They were friends with local law enforcement. 
and they, it was a segregated society, and that's where they grew up. Mm -hmm. They wanted to solve bank robberies. So in this particular case, we knew, we learned from the report that there was a trustee in the jail, turned out he was sort of a local drunk, I've forgotten his name, whom they said they could not find. The FBI couldn't find him. We were, had put this investigative file together and you were thinking about how when you were trial, how are you going to prove this case? And so it happened that the day after President Kennedy, the day that Oswald, Ruby shot Oswald, I was coming down, I was in Mississippi investigating that case, looking for this trustee. <clears throat> and I only had to talk to three or four members of the black community before I found out where he was. I mean, and so I drove to his house and he hadn't been, <laughs> happily hadn't been drinking. But I asked him, I came out and I showed him the photograph of these officers and these people. Was he there? Yes. What happened? And what did you do after the beatings were over? I mopped the blood off the floor of the jail. And will you test, could you, would you testify? I'll testify. And he did in December. And um, it was a Friday afternoon. It was a two-day trial. The second assistant of the Civil Rights Division, St. John Barrett, no longer living, put on the proof and I, was, and I helped him. And uh, they acquitted, you probably know, they acquitted the officers in about two hours. And I ended up, I always remember this, because I ended up then driving over to Sunflower County to see Mrs. Hamer and tell her that uh, we, we lost. But it was, a, it was one of the first beginnings. It was an all-white jury. It was one of the few, I think, last all-white juries that came out of the box before the jury system was really well challenged in many of these counties. Of course, at that time, there were hard, very few blacks on the trial. But then we had Mrs. Hamer's case, and how we had Hartman. Mrs. Hamer take the news? You know, I think she was, I guess you'd have to say she was disappointed. I think we had, but I think they knew that we tried, that the lawyers tried. And we had become, as I was going to say, that the, they saw that there was a difference between the FBI and the lawyers for the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department. And we were pretty much welcomed into the homes of black leaders all over the, in all these counties. I mean, after I got Bob Moses out of jail, and SNCC had a place in, they had an office in Greenwood. So I pretty well got to know those folks. Not that they loved me. They wanted, what they wanted was protection. They kept saying, why can't we have marshals or this is dangerous work. Can't we get a federal police force in? If you read these books, that's what they wanted was protection. And we said, we're sorry, you know, this, that's not the way the system works. We have to make local officials do what they're supposed to do. That's what has to happen in this country. And so I think always there is a reluctance. It, and John describes his case after uh, one of the other cases where they were, the papers were drawn and they decided not to do anything against particular officials because we we didn't want it to appear that any time we wanted to make them responsible for day-to-day -day maintenance of law and order in these communities. Now that was very risky. I mean, you got the problem at Ole Miss, you have all these violent, these riots, but eventually um, the system has to work. And so after, so that was 1963, all these, in all these communities you had these various terrible things. You had the civil rights workers murdered in 1964. But in 63, there were a number of these communities where you had these other, Hartman Turnbow, voting the rights leader in Holmes County. If you could tell us about that case, I think it would be very important to get Let that. Get the, the I'm sure this program. gets a little bit dreary. I don't know. I just... Um, Do you want to wait for him? Oh. Well, we can go on. Okay, we can go, we can go on oh. if you want to tell the, talk, about. talk about Turnbow. Well, <clears throat> the... Uh, I think... Hartman Turnbow had also, in Holmes County, uh, taken people up to register to vote. There was a fairly large community of blacks that was 
owned their own homes. They had gotten land grants from, I think, Franklin, I mean, from Teddy Roosevelt or something. It was historically this community called Chula, outside of Holmes, outside of Lexington, I think, was the county seat of Holmes County. It was also where Hazel Brannon Smith was a had a newspaper. Um, I have a little clipping on there from her. She won a Pulitzer, I think, or a Nobel Prize for her reporting locally about these racial incidents. Anyway, Hartman Turnbow led a, had led a group of people up to uh, register to vote, and they had a major voting rights thing underway. And uh, the Klan, I don't have all the facts in my head anymore, and someone threw a uh, firebomb and shot into his house and torched his house. And he was shooting back at these people as they went around, the Klan's folks, and they then turned out to arrest him for having set a fire to his own house. So we filed a case to get him out of jail. These are, I mean, when I say we filed a case, it probably took a week or two to get the case filed. And once again, the courts said, that they let the state court proceedings take care of this. Mm -hmm. um, he was just a very dynamic local person who was willing to take on the power structure and willing to put himself out front to get these people registered. Um, the, um, and I think I was mentioning to you, Studs Terkel writes about him in this book called Working as a chapter about him. Um, I didn't spend that much time in Holmes County. It was, I happened to be next door when this happened. So we interviewed a number, I helped interview a number of the witnesses and get the case going, but that was sort of the end of that. Um, but it was just another example. There were all these in 1963 during the, you could just see things heating up. Mm. And of course the president was assassinated toward the Medgar Evers was killed. And if you remember them after the Medgar Evers funeral, um, these, this group of blacks and the local police officers were about to have a, go against each other and it was John Doerr who walked out into the street in Jackson, Mississippi and you there are photographs and I have clippings of him holding his hand out saying my name is John Doerr, D-O-A-R, I'm from the Justice Department and everybody knows I stand for what is right and let's go back home and we won't have a riot this afternoon or whatever else. But anyway, that calmed the crowd down and it was quite a gesture or quite a event. I mean, it was quite a heroic thing for John to do. But um, just to finish the voting rights thing, what happens is you'd vote, take all these records back to Washington and you'd spend hours on a microfilm machine and we would categorize these by constitutional sections and by alphabet, and we try to arrange them in every possible way to show so that when we went to court, we could show basically the whites, they let illiterate whites register, or if they gave them a constitutional section, it would be very an easy section like that. If you were black, they'd ask you to define what rolling, the con a long constitutional section setting forth the taxation of rolling stock of a railroad or some other really in very difficult. But, and even with some of those long sections, some of the teachers, for example, in for, at the university, uh, the teachers at the, I think it was Alcorn or whatever is outside of uh, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. We had an after, in that case, the registrar, Forrest Lind, they had, they had, we had held him in contempt of court for failing to register blacks. And at the last, the end of, one of our colleagues, Gordon Martin, wrote a book about that Lynn case. I've forgotten the name of it. Um, but I participated in the final trial, which isn't mentioned in the book very much because Gordon had left. 
but, but I always remember that we had an entire morning of these brilliant black teachers and, other, and educators who had tried to register, who had filled out numerous forms and written these very articulate uh, interpretations, and they were all turned down. And uh, so I think it was, in fact, in one of those lead cases, the appellate court, three judges came to Forest City and had a hearing and listened to this testimony for three days and were just so appalled by what had happened that they held him in contempt and said, you've got to register these people. You can't do this. And then he sort of half listened. And... Um, and so he registered a few more people. But it was always a few more. I mean, it was a very slow process. So you could see that finally when you had this Selma to Montgomery march, I mean, things just kept going. And in 1964, after the murder of the Civil Rights Act, the, what happened, your question was what difference it made. In 64, the Civil Rights Act, which Lyndon Johnson then uh, promoted after the president Kennedy had gotten had been killed, um, the division gained became responsible for enforcing the rights into employment, school desegregation, school cases, employment cases, um, public accommodations were to be open. So in Greenwood, with public accommodations, we had two theaters. One of them belonged to a national chain out of New Orleans. I've forgotten the name of the chain. Had a very nice fellow named Marchand, who was a local person from Greenwood, who said, okay, well, the, Mar the, the national chain said, we're going to comply. We're going to let blacks come into the theater like everybody else. They can sit with whites. So a group of blacks came to Gr the Floor Theater, and Marchand let them in and gave, sold them tickets. In they went. Next thing you know, they were beaten came back, were beaten again, the police were standing outside doing nothing. So we filed a lawsuit to against the police officers again. And the Paramount Theater down the street was owned locally. They said, we're not going to comply even though the law says we have to. We're not going to do it until somebody really makes us. So we filed a complaint against, a, a suit against that theater to require them to desegregate. Eventually, both cases were resolved in our favor. There was an order against the police officers and the police. Unfortunately, I presented that case in, um, I forgot where the trial was, but one of the judges either got sick and something happened or died and they, it, they had to appoint a new judge, so it took a while to resolve them. But they did, I think after we filed, things got a lot better. So we had the, that's just an example in LaFleur County. That kind of thing went on all over. Mm -hmm. And so the same thing in, with employment cases. Now, Gene worked on some fairly major Let's employment Gene, cases. Yeah. Let's bring Gene back in. Yeah. The, Could you talk just a little bit of background to help people who aren't, who aren't, who know nothing, people who don't know anything about the civil rights movement? What were the issues of jurisdiction? Why? What was the relationship between the FBI and the Justice Department? You know, what kind of what were the vectors at play in a, in a more abstract sense, and what that brought these issues to, to the front? Um, well, the the FBI, as it is today, was the investigative agency in the Department of Justice, and um, if I understand it right, the Attorney General is the chief law enforcement officer for the United States. And so, in a sense, the FBI is working for the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice also has within it divisions, for, legal divisions, to enforce the laws of the United States, uh, the criminal laws, laws against antitru the antitrust laws, civil cases that are uh, everything from bank robberies, all those other things that go on. But in order to, when one those cases, in order to evaluate those cases, the FBI is asked to investigate them. 
So the local agents, I mean, the FBI also has its own breakdown for violent crimes. But until the civil rights statutes came along, most of what they were involved with were, were the things that you and I normally think about, bank robberies, kidnappings, the things that involve going across state lines, fraud of various kinds, all these are violent crimes directed against the government agencies of some, Oklahoma City or whatever. But So civil rights and the enforcement of civil rights where you're talking about societal change was something that was very difficult for a local white southern FBI agent to deal with because they grew up in that society and they many of them believed segregation was a, was the way of life that they were taught and so that's why it was so difficult but <clears throat> After, during, you may remember, in the investigation of the murder of the three civil rights workers, it became fairly apparent that what we needed to really get into this, that this was the, the culture of the FBI, that you needed to get FBI agents who were from other parts of the country to help do that investigation and, and really to enforce civil rights laws and to... to so that it wouldn't be the Civil Rights Division lawyers that investigate their own cases. Because that we were the one. Would it had, what was happening? Was well, that's what doing. happened in the voting cases. Mm -hmm. That basically they might trust, at least the black community would trust us. And finding uh, one of my responsibilities in the civil rights worker prosecution was to invest do a jury analysis. Back that was before they had jury experts of various kinds. So I spent several weeks. We did have a copy. We knew it would be in the larger jury pool. It might have been 80 people, of which in the event, in the end, 11 are selected. Um, so we wanted to develop as much information as we could. And I, by that time, we knew many of the black leaders in, that air, in the area of those counties. The number of really friendly whites was very few, people like Hazel Brandon Smith, uh, who ran that paper. And there were others in the community. There were always a f some, maybe a minister, maybe a white family that was well-respected who at least would make some statements periodically or if they weren't always out front. In order to live in those communities, there were no or newspaper editors. The newspaper editor, Hotting Carter in Greenville, was, you know, f fairly well-known as a newspaper that was willing to say it like it was, those people were, Hazel Brandon Smith's paper was bombed one day. I mean, these people, it was like Mountain Eagle down here. All those folks had to show a terrific amount of courage. And whether they could stay or not was another question. I mean, you have somebody like Jerry Hogger, and they basically chased him out of town. So anyway, I, is that an answer you yeah, were looking for? That, because um, you know, it's always kind of confusing why the FBI didn't do its job, but I think you explained it very well. But and I think it's pretty unique that it's two those civil rights division, two civil rights cases, more so than any others. I think normally, I mean, I just read, you and I probably both read about the case in Boston with where they just convicted this guy, Bulger, who, and the whole question was, maybe you should pay off an agent. You, you can, the FBI would pay off. There was this link between the, FBI and the bad guys, and I suppose that happens now and then, but generally I think they're a very effective law enforcement agency and they do their job, but this was very hard for them in and the as South. You said there was a change, an institutional change at, a, at some point to have non-Southern agents working at the, those cases. Right, and I'm sure as, as that evolved, that a new generation of whites grew up in many of those communities where you probably do see some southern agents. And there was an agent in the civil rights case in Meridian who was very key to the investigation and who had a, who was in with the informants and who, re, and who was really, I think, on the right side of things. It was not the way, quite the way Mississippi Burning put it there. It wasn't that, but this agent was uh, straight. He, he did what he thought he could do. And then, but the fellow who led the investigation, this guy Joe Sullivan had come down from the New York office. He was, had been in charge of the New York office, I think, and was the primary person in charge 
ultimately we had to get a confession there too. I mean, it was it was a long process to get that case through. First, they had a they had an we had a grand jury, and before there was an investigation, before there was a confession, and there were a number of the grand jury heard evidence that these local officials in Neshoba County had already engaged in a quite a variety of summer of uh, police case, brutality cases that hadn't come forward and there were a number of other things that came out but we had no confession and so there was no indictment the first time around and then they kept after it and finally got one and then two confessions that ultimately led to the conviction of seven of these folks but so the, the these confessions come uh was that federal or local? Law the, oh no, this yeah. was all federal. federal. No, it was federal, uh, and law was involved, so well, there weren't. They wouldn't do anything. It was pretty apparent they weren't going to do anything. Although eventually they did. You know, last year or about three or four years ago, the, the jury hung on a preacher. One of the masterminds of this case, ironically, was a minister named Killen, who was in the Klan, and. Um, but the jury hung on him. There were seven convictions and eight, if I remember right, uh, either not guilty or hung jury verdicts. And um, they hung on this guy Killen, and the state went after him several years ago and convicted him oh, yeah. from, of the murder. And they did the same thing in the Medgar Evers case. You know, they had to try that fellow twice. Right. And, uh, so there, those, there was a good thing. Those things, I think, showed some progress. But when we brought those cases, the federal cases, initially, there was local law enforcement might as well have not been there. In fact, it was right after that, I think we, before the murder of the three civil rights workers, we had generally been a, gone into these counties ourselves, driven by ourselves as civil rights division lawyers, if I was didn't have a second thought about driving around in Greenwood or anywhere else. After that, after those murders, the Civil Rights Division lawyers started driving in twos. We, we were no longer alone. I mean, people were, I think, worried about their safety, although I think we were generally in, didn't have to worry because people knew we were federal. Did, did you ever run into any trouble? Not really. I always tell this I mean, I always, I, there is this incident. I went up, there was a case once in Yazoo County, Mississippi, uh, which was not a case that I normally was involved with, but I was had the FBI photographing records. We were going to look at the voting uh, system, and we had, we may have already filed the case in Yazoo City, but I had the FBI in one room. They were file, photographing records, and the registrar was a guy named Foot Campbell, that was called Foot Campbell. And he wanted me to come in and talk to him. He wanted to come in and chat with me. And Foot um, started telling me about all these lynchings that he had witnessed in his lifetime. He decided he wanted me to know he, that he'd been to several lynchings. He was a segregationist. There were some good blacks around, but generally, we, why were we making trouble with all these cases? And he said, let me show you something. And he pulled a 38 out of his drawer and he shot it into the floor in front of my foot. <laughs> With the FBI in the next room. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, but it, he didn't shoot me. It was just some sort of statement. And uh, the FBI came running. You know, if, you, if you, this room that we were in is about the size of a corner of our room. So it made, if, you heard it, if you ever shot a 38, or it, they're very noisy, <laughs> and um, so that was that was probably the only time that anything like that ever happened to me. It's the only one I can I ever identify um, as being, and I wasn't really worried after that. I said, "What are you doing?" He said, "I just wanted to show you this gun. I wanted to show you what this gun could do. Some silly thing like that, you know." But um, we and Yazoo City eventually was uh, was uh, I think we filed the case with Frank Schwelb, who became chair of the chief of the housing section, who's a judge. That's another name for you. He's a retired judge in 
<clears throat> now in Washington, D.C., he's actually written a pretty good book that was never published that I had downloaded about his experiences in the Civil Rights Division. What's the last name again? Schwelb, S-C-H-W-E-L-B. Um, and he's in D.C. Uh, he's had some health issues, but it's, it's bro, I read the book I, uh, within the last year. So that, the, that was the uh, civil rights workers case, and of course John prosecuted that case. As he prosecuted the Liuzu, Liu, the Liuzu case, when you asked the Voting Rights Act, I know you can get to Gene. You want to talk to Gene? No, I'll tell you no, about no, the no, no, Voting no, Rights no, Act. No, 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 this no, go. Gene will be very much part of this interview, but tell, finish where you are. Yeah, no, well, yeah. <clears throat> you asked about the Voting Rights Act really was the, turned, it, turned the whole th voting episode upside back where it ought to be. The Voting Rights Act abolished literacy tests. The Voting Rights Act uh, set up a process in these southern counties based on a formula that allowed federal examiners to come in and register voters along with, if the state officials were going to comply, they could r register voters if they, signed their, if they signed their name with hardly any other technical requirements, no more literacy tests. So um, we then, in, uh, we went to see many of these officials and local to see that there was going to be compliance across the board. Um, the first major election, one of the other counties, I've been talking about Greenwood, but in Alabama, Dallas County, Selma, this, it was no accident that they had this march from Selma to Montgomery because Selma in Dallas County, the sheriff, uh, Jim Clark, Jim Clark, had been a uh, poster child for segregationists, and had, uh, and there had been serious attempts to get a major registration drives along the way, and he had. Uh, just been a bulwark against it. In fact, he and the local officials had for over a year just gotten in the way of every registration effort. There were a group of students that came in to help register them and he uh, got a cattle prod out and buzzed them and then arrested, arrested them for resisting arrest. And these, all these incidents were chronicled by in a court decision after John presented it to a federal court, I think in December of 65, there was this case. But Clark never really didn't, and there was eventually an injunction against him. But he was going to run for sheriff again in 1966. And the first primary election was scheduled for May of 66. So there was real concern about how things were going to go. He was it was the first election in Alabama under the Voting Rights Act. And in, I think, the first day that they opened the offices, like a thousand people registered in the various counties. Um, the total number of people who would normally voted in Dallas County it was around 7,000. After the blacks registered, after the Voting Rights Act, there were 15 in most of those, and almost all of the additional were the black registrants. It, you, uh, this has all been written down in some respects, but what happened in that case, John was in Selma. I wasn't there that day, but I got there two days later. The primary ballot had like 70, it was, they were still using paper ballots in Selma, and there were like 73 different things to mark. So this was also the first election in which there were black voting officials. They never had black voting officials. So they were trying to be in the black precincts very careful. So at four o'clock in the morning, all the other boxes had come back in to the primary, to the, to the central place where they count the votes, except in these four, in these five black precincts. And 
So the election officials, the primary election officials who were white, came out and got a, and they helped finish the count themselves and impounded the ballot boxes. And the next day they met and they decided, and the observer, federal observers were at that point, the next day they met and they looked and they looked at the boxes and they decided the best thing to do was just not include these. There must be some fraud here because of these black officials that took until four in the morning. They didn't do this right, and so we just won't include the box, these boxes. And the result of that was basically the election had been very close between Jim Clark and his chief opponent. Wilson Baker. Wil Wilson Baker, who had been the safety director. So actually in that counting, two or three of the commissioners, there were CPAs that reviewed these counts. Two or three of them had said, you ought to count couple of these boxes because they didn't, they, we don't see anything wrong. They said no. So we filed this case, the government, the, uh, the Civil Rights Division filed a lawsuit to require them to count the, the ballots that had been legitimately filed by the voted uh, by this group. <clears throat> well, there were 17,000 votes and we counted every one of them. And Jean and Dorothy <laughs> Uh, were part of that, and so we stayed there for a week. We filed this federal case. First, we went to Judge Johnson, whom I mentioned, and they got him to issue an order that they could not, that they had to keep the ball ballots safe in boxes. They couldn't do anything with it. They had to pr keep the ballots and protect them. And then we filed, Judge John the case was then assigned to Judge Thomas, who was the chief judge in the Southern District. He had kept the Mobile school system pretty well segregated. Mm. They'd appealed him every year, and every year he'd add one more grade when they wanted to, de to desegregate the schools. Then they'd appeal him to the Fixed Circuit, and they say, you've got to do more, and he'd add one or two more grades. So we were very worried about this judge before we we're going to try this case. So we got to the trial, and... Jean and Dorothy had been watching these ballot boxes in the sheriff's office. And what do you mean we were counting, examining ballots? And you were looking at ballots. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. You were counting ballots. We were doing it all. So day after day, I mean thousands. Yeah. The yeah, I mean, did you maybe they all seventeen by, observed by yeah Jim Clark's deputies, who were trying to right. romance us. And wouldn't we like to go to a clan rally and all this? And you know, you're scared. You don't know what's going to happen or what they're going <laughs> to. And one of them gave Dorothy. She still has the never button. Yeah. I was there. This guy's name was Buck. This big deputy sheriff who <laughs> kept trying to put the mic on Jean. Okay. And when we went into the in this little tiny room where all the ballots were, well, we we put the, that was we, the button. That it, the button never. says never. You know, that's the you know the segregation button. Says never. It's One used of them, all over. Would, you thought that would win you over. No, it, no well, <laughs> he, of course. I, I think, don't know what that, you know, who knows what's going well, on. Well, Dorothy had it. I think they just, he just thought this will give you a token of our affection because they like these two women who there, were. There's, well, yeah, there, see, there's yours not, you never. know, that's there as a bumper sticker. That. that was in Bogalusa, but it was all over the South. Never. I think it might have been Wallace's. Um, but um, okay, thanks. the uh, so the night when we were getting all this proof together, the night before John comes in and says, "Well, John, you should put this case on Cork into this John." So I did. So we had this trial for several days in front of Judge Thomas, and we had federal observers. At one point, I wondered whether we we thought we might have to put Jean on the stand, but but we didn't, and. Um, uh, to make a long story short, we had federal observers who had watched these various, the countings, and had been at the polls. There were several hundred observers in Dallas County that day at every polling place. I mean, they were really worried. This We were going to make sure, as much as we could, that this election would go right. Because this uh, was the first, again, this was the first one. This was the first one. It was the primary in Dallas County. So... Long, Judge Thomas, we filed our briefs, and Judge Thomas said, 
there was nothing, he saw nothing, no irregularities, only minor irregularities if there were any, and you shouldn't deprive the voter of the, of the right to have his vote or her vote counted, even because of maybe some minor irregularity by an election official. And though he ordered the votes to be counted and said, uh, there was actually an exception. If the election officials found one or two ballots that were, if there was something wrong, they could discard those ballots, but he had to find them, but they didn't. So he ordered them, and this was too much for him. The, the right to vote was very important, even for this judge who'd, who had let, held on with, uh, kept the school system segregated for a long, long time. So that was a big win. That was the first win on the voting rights case. Now you remember probably in back to 64, there was after the uh, March, not 64, but the March from Selma to Montgomery, you had this Viola Leozu situation who had, she had come down from uh, Detroit, the, I think. Or Ohio, from somewhere near Detroit, uh, as a person of conscience who wanted to help. And she and this young black man were taking, driving, uh, we're gonna, she was gonna give a ride back to somebody to, to Montgomery and the Klan, of course, shot and killed her that day. And there were several other incidents of violence around the march that happened. I mean, the whole, the injunction again, John, the government uh, went to Judge Johnson for an injunction to protect the marchers. I think, you know, the message is, I think that the legal, the system, the judges, the work that the division did was pretty substantial. I mean, this was a significant case, the, the Dallas County case. And the whole effort to get the, <clears throat> the Voting Rights Act of 65, the principles of that act, came out of those earlier cases I was describing to you. The freezing principle, the notion that you ought not to, you, you can't use a literacy test to deprive somebody the right to vote. Now the Supreme Court this year recently uh, turned some of that upside down, uh, saying that data, everything is, that everything's okay today. Even though there was all this testimony during the congressional hearings that said there was plenty of reason to keep the act going. But, so what, what was your response to that, to that recent ruling, given your experience, both of you, given your experience then? Well, I mean, I think the minority is right. I think uh, Justice Ginsburg is right. I think they, they should have, they shouldn't have decided the case that way. And uh, we heard Hillary Clinton at the American Bar Association spend a substantial amount of her time saying we've got to do something to uh, turn that case around. Now, whether it's congressional work or lawsuits that are going to be filed in some of the cases, you saw in a number of these states that they immediately started coming out with voter ID laws or other kinds of statute laws that are obviously intended to turn the clock back and make it more difficult for people, minorities, to register to vote and that kind of thing. So I think it was quite, I'm sorry that the, I feel bad, I feel bad. I mean, I think the court, the decision's wrong, but you got, I don't agree with Bush v. Gore either, but that's our system, and we don't go into the streets. We start working on trying to change it. Mm. I'm going to close with that. We did interviews in Bogalusa with the Hicks family and all. They were doing testings of the Civil Rights Act. Yeah, like, were you involved in, in any of that, or was that? Well, I'd have to go. They were doing <clears throat> testing of at, at restaurants and mm -hmm. public accommodations and that sort of thing. Well, the this paper, these these pictures, <clears throat> well, you did the never one. One of these pictures is uh, these folks were picketing, and he's getting doused by the local barber. And uh, this this picture of, this is James Farmer leading the march. Uh, I hadn't remembered the Hicks family, but I guess that's, uh, they were leading the, mar the march of uh, local blacks who were uh, trying to um, support the uh, testers and get 
these stores to comply and employers to comply. Uh, this is a similar view, except it has two lawyers. One of them is Lou Cowder, and the other is John Rosenberg. When we were at that march, um, often the civil rights division lawyers were the buffer between the police and the demonstrators, and this it was a. a, a and, and why? Why was that? You, you, you marched purposely for that reason? Or? No, I went, why were we here? No, we weren't really, I guess <clears throat> we were there to kind of, we were observing, observing. So, which we did a lot of. Mm -hmm. We were observing or interviewing mm -hmm. so that we uh, could gather information. I, that was the, I was saying, I spent about a month in Bogalusa helping to put this case together. The, a lot of it was FBI work, um, but there were just a series of incidents directed against local blacks who were, as you say, either testing or trying to get stores and restaurants to comply. And it um, seemed to me one of the incidents involved uh, a very liberal senator from Arkansas, Brooks Hayes, was supposed to come and give a talk. He eventually didn't, and there were the the Klan came out with a bunch of threats and leaflets, and um, he decided he wouldn't come. He was afraid, but so Core organized a protest march that was fairly large, um, and uh, this it was really we were observing these marches. Lou was there for a while. I don't. I didn't remember. I don't know how long he was there, but I spent almost a month together. And then at the end, I went to see, uh, we put the case together and went to Judge Wisdom. Mm -hmm. I <clears throat> always tell people when you, when you go to law school, your, one of your early courses is called equity or remedy. And the history of equity is that... Uh, um, it was a change in the law from just being able to get damages and to to the the courts with and the equity courts had a chancellor mm -hmm. who could stop bad behavior. Mm -hmm. You could, and if you needed a writ, you supposedly could go. This goes historically. You could go see the chancellor even in his nightshirt, so that you could get a relief. And that, so in my Klan case, I always remember I went at that time, the Fifth Circuit had its main offices in, was in New Orleans in the old Fish and Wildlife Building. And at the time, I don't think there was even a, a good air conditioning system. So I went looking for Judge Wisdom, Minor Wisdom, on a Saturday. It was hotter than blazes. I finally found Judge Wisdom in the back in his office, and he was sitting there in his undershirt. And so I went to Judge Wisdom and said, Your Honor, I have, we have this petition. We have to get a preliminary injunction against the Klan for, to stop these activities. I mean, we would need a trial, but in order to get things underway, you have to get him to sign this order. And so he did. And so I always think that I went to see some people saw the chancellor in, in, in his night nightshirt. Church. I got an injunction from Judge Wisdom in his un in his undershirt, he was hotter than boy. He was perspiring. I um, later got an award in his name, but I never and I and he escaped before I could get him to sign the program. But um, keep looking. It's I know it's in there. What are we looking for? I thought the hose picture from Bogota. Oh Lisa. yeah, I'm sure it's here. There was there are a couple of these pictures that and I think this is a different picture of the march. Wait a minute. That's the, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, honey. So, John, you said you, you, weren't, you weren't worried about your safety too often, but, Gene, did you worry about him or about yourself? Well, we were, well, we were not, a, you know, at that time I wasn't married to him. Mm -hmm. um, but you liked him. So, oh, I did <laughs> like him. I, I, he, yeah, I did like him. Um, uh, there were times, there it is. There were times when I was really frightened, and we've had some pretty unpleasant incidents because, of course, I was in primarily in Alabama in those early years, and 
and uh, we never knew if we needed to seek uh, go into a restaurant what would happen you know our water would get spit in and that stuff we would get that kind of treatment and you never knew whether that was going to escalate escalate I mean now when you look back you think oh how safe we were but we didn't feel that safe and uh, I remember once, we worked very hard, and on the Meredith March, um, I was the traveling connector between the attorneys who were in the field with the march, walking with the marchers, and the, uh, the attorney general, and th they would report to me and I would report to him. Oh, wow. And we worked up until like 10 and 11 o'clock at night, and I remember one of the attorneys and I decided we'd just take a walk. It was Yazoo. I was in Yazoo City, Mississippi, and we'd just take a walk around the block. And we got about a quarter of the way <laughs> around the block, and all of a sudden this car pulls up behind us, screeching, and ju the people jump out and they start following us. And George, who is from Mississippi, said, Now, Jean, just keep looking straight ahead and keep on walking. And I remember when you're frightened like that, your feet feel like you're it's, we're walking through mud. <laughs> but we made it back to the hotel and nothing happened. But we didn't know. And so we, were, feel, we felt very vulnerable sometimes. I thought you were going to remember after the, the Lois Reese, one of the, in, oh, Selma, oh. in Selma, we hired the first black secretary our office. We opened an office. The Civil Rights Division in its later years started open, had a few offices outside of Washington. Mm -hmm. And the first one was in Selma, Alabama. Later there's one in New Orleans. And the lawyer who's in charge of the office who lived there in Selma was Chad Quaintance. Quaintance. Who's Quaintance. He's in Minneapolis. And he has, uh, after he left the division, he went to a large law firm in Minneapolis and then he semi-retired and went to divinity school and is, is and never became a minister, but he's been teaching religion. He taught religion at Hanover College and he's had some eyesight problems, but he's uh, there. And so he's one of the folks who spoke <clears throat> on that particular event and talked about it, one of his Miss, uh, Alabama cases. But he also mentioned Lois Reese, who is... Um, this secretary who in, Selma. We, in Selma now many years later of course but and she's still living um, but she had we had worked together very very hard preparing a big massive school desegregation case well, against when, Macon in Alabama and was it not to, that was the, no it was Lee against Macon and okay. that's when they we were up for three days and nights straight around the clock and uh, she was a small town. She came from Selma. We were in Montgomery, and she was my roommate. And at the, after the third day, we had when it was fi finished, we went um, and out and had a big meal, and then we went back to the motel room. And uh, she had run out of her epileptic her oh, yeah. <laughs> epileptic medicine, but she didn't know how. You know. I now know living here in uh, in a rural setting that you don't necessarily think first about calling back to the pharmacy or I mean she, I can understand why she didn't try to get a refill but uh, she had a, a, a grand mal seizure yeah. Yeah. You guys are gonna die. and I, <laughs> and I uh, Call, I, you know, I called for help. I called the desk mm -hmm. and asked for an ambulance because I didn't know what I was seeing right. at that time. And um, when the first ambulance came, they saw she was black and they wouldn't take her. So I was really mm -hmm. upset then, you know, because <laughs> I didn't know what. And she was, she was, she, her seizure lasted a long time. And so uh, I Terrible. called John. <laughs> who was in another room, and I said, I can't get an ambulance. You have to help me get somebody to take to the hospital. And so finally we got an ambulance, and we went to the hospital. And uh, they treated her for about, once she, they got her conscious, 
and she said that she had epilepsy. I don't know what they did because I wasn't in the emergency room. But they said, okay, now you go home. And we went home. And she had another seizure. And then, of course, she had another seizure. She had another seizure. And so uh, it was a hard, it was a hard <laughs> mm. uh, lesson in how e unequal. Mm. I mean, I'm sure if she'd been white, they would have kept her. Mm -hmm. and that it was a terrible happen. experience. Have you ever seen a grand mal seizure? It's <laughs> unbelievable. You think somebody's dying right in front of you. I th I figured after that, we might as well get married. <laughs> I thought. Actually, after I left on that trip. Actually, that's a personal story. Sidebar, no. personal story. But we, we were, so then we went home, right? So, but I didn't get, John didn't get to go home. Well, I had a, some vacation coming. At home is D.C.? At home at that time was Philadelphia, where okay. my folks were. Okay. And so I took, hopped the plane in Montgomery to go to Philly. And John got ordered to well, I North think he Carolina to, help, to Julius uh, Chambers, to the Klan. They'd bombed Julius oh, Chambers' house in okay. Charlotte. Yeah. I think John also knew I was from Gastonia next door. But <clears throat> and my family was in Gastonia. So he sent me to Charlotte to look, to, and he thought, to investigate. We didn't know. We actually ended up doing, going before a grand jury because there was some Klan activity in Charlotte. I mean, they were after Jews, and you know, fortunately, he wasn't hurt. But the same fellow I was telling you about with uh, about the Carroll County case, Nick Flannery. I don't know how it happened, but he was in Charlotte to help me do this investigation, where we ended up in front of a grand jury. But Nick and I, during we were at lunch, two days later, and. Uh, I said, Nick, I'm, you stay, we were going, standing in line to go to lunch. And there was a rest, long line. I said, Nick, I'm gonna, I'll be back in a minute. I'm going to call Gene. I think I'm going to ask Gene to marry me. <laughs> <laughs> that was the Charlotte trip. She'd gone back to Philly, and I was in Charlotte. My family's in Gastonia. It's just 20 miles away from Charlotte. It's kind of like going to Pikeville. And um, so anyway, I called up and spoke to her and spoke to her mom and dad and what, next day they were on the road well, to Gastonia. Say, my, my family may not know everything, but they figured out really quick that marrying somebody with a German uh, name, uh, they better get to, they better present themselves before John's parents immediately so that they can establish rapport <laughs> before. Well, that's just a little sidebar, but that's what I, that's actually what happened. Mm -hmm. I proposed to her over the phone. We'd worked hard. <clears throat> I said, if well, she put you know, me when through you work this, with somebody you really get to know them, and so it wasn't a big and surprise. In the of all that, it's like being at battle. Some, some, yeah, to some extent. probably. Yeah. Probably yeah. true. Or in the you're military, probably, you're on yeah. something. Yeah, this, there was a lot of hard people working really hard for together for you know for um, principles they believed in, mm -hmm. and you. How, how did you keep yourselves going? Was it exhausting work? And how did you? How did you? I think it just, people... In, in the Civil Rights Division, everybody worked. Everybody, from the top, from John Doerr to, to the secretaries. I mean, everybody did what needed to come next. And we did the very best we could all the time, because we knew it was important to do the very best you could all the time. Because we were, it, this was history. You knew you were living history. And there were some divorces along the way. And there were hardships, yeah. Well, it's yeah. very hard on the wives at John. home. And yeah, I mean, if you're single. But it was, um, I think you're just going uphill a lot against these judges. And you just knew, like with the Judge Cox, you knew that you were going to have to appeal and you're going to go to the next end. So mm -hmm. it was called making a record. You wanted to put this case together because you knew you're probably going to lose. So when the next court looked at it, they would say, he, this is wrong, right. and you're right. going to reverse that judge. And um, So you had a sense of the long haul then? Of the, yeah. Oh, well, you I wanted it to come, right, come around to what sure. you're, you're thinking. But you knew that it was going to be. It was going to be the long haul. And I think in that way, the, um, if you look at the history of the Voting Rights Act and the, case, the testimony from Kat, I guess Katzmack and these other people who testified, they basically had said, 
this is not going to work in just one case at a time. We are, we are doing the best we can through the courts, mm -hmm. but blacks are entitled to vote and we need to have it happen. Right. And so Martin Luther King, the march, all that together. And so I think the, the cases had a real place. I mean, it was like the first mm -hmm. attack. It was the first launch, it was a launch. And, uh, and, and uh, I think the division in the department, the attorney generals, they deserve great credit for that. Mm -hmm. It's not a story everybody knows. I mean, it didn't, the movement, it, I mean, the relationship might have been better, but Bob Moses knew that he could call John any hour. Mm -hmm. He might say no, or he might say, we can't, I only have eight lawyers, we can't send them all to LaFleur County or next door, but they developed a relationship, and I think actually a lifelong relationship even afterwards. You know, Bob became well known for this algebra project. He's sure. become an educator, and yeah. we've seen him a couple of times since then. And <clears throat> Lawrence Giot, uh, you know, you know some of these names, and many of them we knew and saw very often. But I think you could see that, I mean, that was enough to keep, I mean, if you knew Fannie Lou Hamer or Mr. Eskridge, and she's out there chopping cotton and thinks she might lose her job, or Eskridge is set all out there by himself. He wants to, just all he wants is to get his kid into school, which certainly is not the most popular thing to do. I mean, he's really, they're putting their lives on line. I don't think, I never felt like we were putting our life on the line. I mean, I think you, you've got that little yellow, you've got that black thing in your pocket. That was a funny, this is one, I just happened to see it. It was one that has me up front. But, it, you know, you've got that, that little black thing in your pocket is the Justice Department ID. Okay. Oh, yeah. Which people, I think, knew. I mean, most of these rural counties, they figured you were either an insurance salesman or you were a Justice Department lawyer. Because <laughs> you were in a suit and tie. Yeah, because you were dressed well. Yeah. yeah, I mean. <clears throat> but some of the, well, the civil rights workers dressed well, too, at least at certain points. Yeah, I don't think they were too conscious, but they certainly didn't look, I mean, they were, hmm. they were students from all over. Yeah. I was thinking when you just mentioned that, we had this case in Itabina, Mississippi. The black section in Itabina, which is outside of Green Floor County, black section is known as Balance Do. Had you read that? You're shaking your head. I read that your head. in your, uh, when I was doing some research, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, they had a. They were in the church night after night. This group, and somebody threw a smoke bomb into the church. So they go to the deputy sheriff. They take a, all of the church. The whole group goes up to the deputy sheriff's house. And it's nighttime, <clears throat> and they arrest them. From 15 to 80, the oldest person was 80. The youngest was 15. They took them into jail. And the next morning, I think it was the next morning. Then maybe two days later. They tried them in groups of ten. What was the charge? What were they charged? They were disturbing the peace. By going to the, <laughs> yeah, the by going house. to, and uh, I don't have any pictures of it. We had to file a lawsuit to get them out to try to, and they sent them all. They all fined them all. I think five hundred dollars, and they sent them to thirty days in jail on the county farm. All the, a few days later, they let some of the really older people out. Guy's name was Art Perry, but we filed this case, and John put me on the stand to talk about. It. I sat there and watched them convict all these people. This justice of the peace, mm -hmm. and uh, so we filed that case. And actually, eventually, we that was for Judge Clayton, and we lost. What happened in the meantime was the National Council of Churches got some bond money and got them, got these people out. But I went up there every day to that penal farm to interview these people for about two weeks. But they were in, sitting there in terrible shape <clears throat> for no reason at all. I mean, it's kind of like these things you see in other... I mean, nobody was killed in that situation, mm -hmm. but it was... It would never happen. Would you happen if you were white, if that was a white group? Never in your life at that time. This was 63 again. I mean, there are just all these incidents that ended up leading up to, I mean, at some point, Congress had to do something. And they did. And Johnson, I mean, this Lyndon Johnson, to his credit, and the law, people who drafted that. So, 
Here's the, this was the Bogalusa uh, barber spraying water on one of the protesters who was there and helped during that case. Hmm. Um, I Were you to, there, Gene? I went to that barber shop. No. <laughs> that barber shop? Yeah, yeah. Barber In Bogalusa? Yeah. I'm yeah, you may very well have. It still runs as a barber shop. He wasn't going to cut hair for blacks. Hmm. Rainbow Gray. Well, it, the, that, that poster, Courage, have you seen that one? Where they. Mm -hmm. they uh, that was, this, I think, maybe that was Bogalusa. I, I never knew. Right. I have it in the other room. That's why I know it. Um. <clears throat> where I know, you know, I know that we're we're about on the um, the anniversary, so I wanted to ask about the the march on Washington. Were you where were you? Were you in the field when that? Um, I was in Washington during that little period, and I was thinking about all the '63 stuff. I was there, and I was in the Department of Justice, uh, watching the march. Our office. <clears throat> was on the first floor, and so I think I went outside and watched a lot and watched some of it. I didn't get up to the speakers. It was actually a work day. I was in, I don't know, was Ms. Hamer's case. Um, was it Mar What was the date? It's now. What was the date of the march yeah, on Washington? Guess, it would have been now, right? Yeah, it's in a couple of weeks. So. The, um, yeah. I think it was just during a little interim period that I was in Washington and saw the march. But it was really a work day, mm -hmm. unless you took off to be. Part of that, mm -hmm. and I. But I do remember. Uh, I do remember the march, and what you know. So. You had a role to play later on when they had the city. During the Washington riots. Right before them, when they had the the. Um, Resurrection City. Res yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. What, what, what was your role well, we were. I mean, we were. Again, it was one of those observer working in between things. Marion Wright Edelman, who's mm -hmm. head of the Children's Defense Fund, was negotiating with John. You know, how long can we stay? They were going to stay there and try to get some of their demands met and on voting. And, and, and uh, what was that? The aftermath too? Do you remember the Resurrection City? Was that? Did that follow? A, is it poor people's campaign? I'm not. I, I get these mixed up. I was trying to remember. It seemed like it came right after something. But we were, <clears throat> I mean, I, and the riots were right before, or was right after the Nixon uh, came into office. The, the big, the because John Mitchell, well, no, there were, Gene was thinking about the, the riots. I'm, I was thinking about the inauguration. I was on the street. Oh, right. Nixon had, had mod, right. We had quite a number of people out. With Mitchell, mm -hmm. at that point, we weren't going to stay much, really, uh, trying to ensure that that was going to be a safe process. Mm -hmm. During the riots, uh, the riots after King's assassination? it was after Martin Luther King was killed, mm -hmm. right, 1968. Mm -hmm. Now there. Um, I worked with Nick Flannery, the same fellow I mentioned earlier, and he and I went to Memphis and we prepared the extradition papers to get Ray, James Earl Ray, back to this country from England. So I remember getting these affidavits. You all just came from Memphis. We did were just there, yeah, we just went to the museum. The new yeah. Civil Rights Museum? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a wonderful, quite a, impressive, isn't it? And they added a section since we were. Well, you and I went to the first one, right? They added a whole new section, I think, which I haven't they're, seen. They're yet. building a huge new wing right now, twenty-seven million dollar really expansion. But yeah. but they've got all the state's evidence on display. Oh, really? Which is very interesting. I don't know how they got a hold. I of mean, this was towards the very beginning, so we were getting affidavits from police officers and fingerprint people and looking at the and, and the gun and what we needed was enough information together to get him extradited back to this country. I think the extradition papers were really prepared in Washington by some, but he and I went down and we got all this information together. And that and fell that, to you in the Civil Rights Division. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Now, the one, I think that probably the Attorney General's office may have put the case pieces together, but yeah, they wanted us to, 
to do that. They did, or they wanted me and, and Nick, I don't know where we were at the time. Um, may have been the Carroll County, no, it was 68. And then after that, I remember when these riots in Washington, Cyrus Vance was my boss. I mean, he wasn't at the Civil Rights Division, but well, he was secretary of something. Yeah. <laughs> and he, I spent a lot of time with him for a couple of days trying to, they were arresting a lot of people, you know, and they were sending them to where the place in... Quantico. Maryland, Quantico. Mm. We were, well, it's a little vague, but for me, some of the, but the division was very much involved in that again. I think, again, partly because the uh, protesters and the black activists knew that they were going to get a fair shake, mm -hmm. that people were going to be respectful and appreciate what they did, but that we had the, a job to, to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> Gene mentioned the poll tax case a while ago. I just I don't know how much you want to say about that, but the... You know, the poll tax was another one of those Reconstruction Act things that mm -hmm. required people to pay each year to be able to, as a condition of voting, mm -hmm. and then it was cumulative over time, and it was only throughout the South. It was another device to prevent people from registering to vote. So the legislation that implemented the Voting Rights Act, there had been one, a case... Uh, that it had been, cha I think one of the, the lawyers committee might have filed a case. But anyway, the, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 required the Attorney General to forthwith file an action to contest the poll tax mm. in the southern states. And we had those cases ready to go. And on the Monday, I went down and on the Monday after the act was signed, I went to Miss to Jackson and filed the poll tax case in Mississippi. Turned out I ended up working and preparing the Alabama poll tax case. <clears throat> and Steve Pollock, who was by then the attor assistant attorney general, was he f maybe his first assistant still before he became assistant attorney general? I think so. He argued the case. So we put all these cases together and we basically had the this history of segregation, all the segregation statutes. The interesting thing in that Alabama case was that, and this is a, a, in the opinion that the court issued, just before, even after we filed this case, there was an election coming up locally, a statewide election, and Governor Wallace had a brochure printed with his picture on it that went that the highway patrol went all over Alabama distributing it to all the white schools to take home to their parents. Not only to the white schools. I mean, this was done after we filed this case. So we put it in the record, and if you open the opinion, you see this brochure with Wallace's picture on it describing this thing. And, you know, even down to the right before trial, they were going to do everything they could to prevent blacks or to at least to maximize a white election and electorate. And uh, so there was all the this history. We had this legislative history of all these terrible remarks made by the legislators way back in 1900. The only reason we we need to stop this these blacks from voting. I mean, it's so there's no no hidden language. I mean, it's very emphatic. And then all the way forward to describing the statistics. But then the court, the court invalidated the poll tax in all of these states in two or three different cases. But it was another, and it was, the, again, the result of all this litigation that had come along, I mean, where we had all this information and uh, that had come. But it was another big uh, it was a, a nice a case that I uh, spent a good bit of time on. And I did a case before Judge Johnson, Fred Gray, who's a prominent black attorney in Montgomery still. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you haven't, he's really a terrific person. Uh, he filed a case contesting one of the elections right after, uh, in which a fair, I think uh, it was really a local election 
and I represented the government, the judge, what Judge Johnson started to do was in most of these civil rights cases, whether the government brought it or not, he would order the government to the United States to be made a party because he wanted the civil rights division lawyers right. in his court. Right. John or one of his representatives. So I, this was not a case that had a particularly good outcome, but I sat there with Fred Gray probably for, I think this case took two or three weeks of putting on testimony about the election and the getting all the statistics in. And we were advising the court uh, as best we could about what to do. And in, I th in the end, if I'm, in the end, I think all that came out of it really was maybe some reforms in the way they were supposed, to, they would needed to carry out their election process. But the election itself of the officials was not overturned. And but it was Fred's, in that case, that he had brought. I got to know him pretty well. But, but Judge Johnson was really, man, you talk about a hero. You asked about the, and so so were all of, all of these judges, Judge uh, Wisdom and Judge Brown and Judge Bell, <clears throat> who was from Atlanta, eventually went to the 11th Circuit. He was the Attorney General. I was trying to think who the other circuit judge judges were um, that were on that Fifth Circuit. Um, I just can't remember all their names, but it's... Uh, Sure, it was a blessing to have him on the court at the time because so many of these district judges were Southerners who were, you know, who were made made it very difficult to litigate in front of them, and it took so much longer. Mm -hmm. Same thing in Louisiana, mm -hmm. except for Judge Johnson. Same thing in Northern Alabama, uh, in the Birmingham district, because you had these a Northern, a Southern, or an Eastern, or Western district federal court in each one of these states, as we have today, and so putting these initial trial records together was invariably for the next court. Right, right. And uh, it was a slow process. But it really, in the end, it really made the record for the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's quite a story in that sense. And Brian tells that history in his book really well, I think. Did, did you have a permanent residence during these days, or were you... I mean, it sounds like you're in the field most of the time. We lived in Washington. Yeah, right. And <clears throat> when we went to Houston, we moved to Houston for six months because that was going to be a fairly large case. But in the 60s, those even before Gene came, we were probably gone. John described, it's interesting, in this Florida Law Review note that he wrote some years ago, he said he'd go outside on a Friday, you could see the briefcases lined up outside the Civil Rights Division offices. And back then, the people would get on the plane. They'd either go to Memphis or Birmingham or wherever they were going. And there were the airplane were the DC threes. Remember, mm -hmm. there were C forty sixes in the Air Force or C forty sevens, I guess. And they'd take off on a Friday afternoon for two weeks, right. and we'd go down and usually photograph several counties. We would have made the arrangements to get the FBI in and to you try to mm -hmm. photograph four or five co counties. Like I also did the Jackson, Hines County, that's mm -hmm. Jackson. Mm -hmm. We photographed all those records and I know they remember they have they had a courthouse in Rankin, I think's the name of the town, and not only in Jackson, but you know, you're looking at thousands and thousands of records. And then in some of them that some of the in some of the larger cities like Jackson, some rec some blacks had gotten registered to vote. Mm -hmm. But again, it was not carte blanche. It was if you were either they knew you or they knew they'd have to register some and get a little more sophisticated than it would in, in the rural counties. But we would all have responsibilities for several you know, of these voting cases at once. And some of them would, as they came to trial, first John tried many of these cases himself and Bob Owen tried the case. and. Then, Eventually, those of us, you know, the law, the line lawyers, mm -hmm. grew up a little bit under this system. It's a very process. disciplined system. In, yeah. in the government, yeah. you write a complaint and you send it up to the next person who redlines it and sends it back to you, and you gradually is. Yeah. I mean, and the uh, yeah. So, we learned to be pretty good lawyers under that system. I mean, I always 
tell people. So I think it stood me really in good stead when we came here because mm -hmm. I had to teach one to teach another group of lawyers how to well, let, let's be good jump lawyers. To that and and we'll probably just take another ten minutes or so. I'm going to close the file. Oh no! I was just thinking. I was just thinking about when yeah. he when he said they over they really over prepared every case, yeah. and visualized the Houston school system. We took and color coded on maps of Houston every single residence in the uh, uh, enrolled student to show how the busing, yeah. how the how the, the lines were. It was just, in, you just cannot imagine how labor-intensive that was before computers. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just amazing. We would call them dot maps. Dot you know, maps. blacks had, were red and whites were green, and we showed where the schools were, and they were busing black students past mm -hmm. white schools, white schools and white stuff. schools past black schools. Yeah. His was, and that case had gone on for many years, and uh, Judge Connolly... It was a, we had four or five lawyers working with me, mm -hmm. plus how many research analysts? It was kind of like an antitrust case, footlockers of records, the Houston oh, yeah. school kids going way back. <clears throat> and what we wanted was busing to try to uh, remedy this, the effects of this past discrimination and try to get some reasonable integration into the Houston school system because the inner city black schools were pretty bad. Right. They spent all their money out in suburbia. The problem, the, one of the problems was you had this black core and then you had the, the beginnings of a donut around it of Spanish speakers. Mm -hmm. And so some of the pairing, and then you had white suburbia. Mm -hmm. And so how do you really fix that? Judge Connolly in the end paired up a lot of schools. Many of them were black and Mex Spanish speakers, mm -hmm. Chicano. Um, but then they appealed that. I think in the end, the, the Court of Appeals, I, we were gone by then, uh, required some busing. But the, I think the best thing that happened was that the voters threw the school board out and they threw out this lawyer, the lawyer on the other side. And that had happened in many places. This lawyer became a millionaire off the school case. I mean, he was a corporate lawyer, but they'd been... They'd been resisting desegregating the school system for years, and this lawyer had made a living off that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really, uh, had for, for many years. And if, same thing in Little Rock. I had a couple of cases in Arkansas. This big firm in downtown Little Rock representing these school districts, these rural school districts that were still totally segregated. Right. And, um, and they were, I mean, they did other work, but they were well paid to keep the school system segregated and so in Houston they finally ditched him and they had a whole new school board and I think that over time Houston I mean it's an enormous system mm -hmm. now it's even twice as big as it was when we were there uh, but I think uh, they've really reformed done, uh, their schools mm -hmm. so but those are different same thing with the employment cases I mean we haven't mentioned them I when we started when I became chief of the western section we sued the uh, electrical workers in Las Vegas because the union was uh, the blacks couldn't get a job you couldn't get into the apprenticeship you couldn't get in, into the union because you were black uh, which you hardly ever realize and it's still pretty much a segregated town I mean the housing patterns we sued the steam fitters in Los Angeles roadway. sued the huh? roadway roadway express that was Jean's case Roadway Trucking Company with my Ewald. They were in oh, Birmingham, right? Yeah, they were in Birmingham. Yeah, but the, the division, the same thing with schools afterwards. <clears throat> there were a lot of schools in Indianapolis, schools in Oklahoma City. As the, as the, after the Civil Rights Act of 64, the division really expanded its uh, work into other parts of the country as well. I mean, it was not on... It needed to happen because mm -hmm. the all segregation didn't just happen in the South. Right. It might have been more de facto in some areas in the larger, much more difficult to do the right. ch Chicago school case, I don't know, or Indianapolis. But so let's use this as a segue then into um, your move out of out of the division and and to here and the work that you took on here and this idea of. 
uh, taking on other social um, justice issues and how these may be related one to the other? Well, I mean, I think they are, as you always part, they are related. I mean, we hoped we could, I guess I was hoping that I could continue uh, doing public interest work. I did talk to some private firms, but we went on this big camping trip and wasn't quite sure. And but we left the division because the administration changed and the cases that got filed, were what congressional district they were in seemed to become more important than what was in the case. Well, and they retreated on school desegregation. I mean, I think it's <clears throat> not an easy decision. And there were some civil rights division lawyer revolts. I don't know if you remember. There was some of that history when they felt that the di division wasn't doing, enforcing the law the way they should. Um, and uh, actually that took, most of that happened while we were in Houston. So, but um, um, whether it, long short of, if you're gonna leave, especially if you're in a position of some responsibility, whether they're gonna fill your, your shoes with somebody who's not gonna do the kind of work at the level that you were doing it, mm -hmm. people who are really committed, mm -hmm. should you stay and fight it out mm -hmm. and try to push them to do that, or can you? Um, but we decided um, also, because I think if you stay in government service, you sort of start pricing yourself out of the market. I mean, you're making fairly good money. You're doing fairly good economically too, and if you're gonna switch of course, we took a big dive, you know, we half. took a white It's only half. When we came here, but we may do, you know, we decided money wasn't all that important to were you, us. Were you tired, too? Did you need a break from that, that pace or not? Well, oh. we went on this camping trip for three months with a tent and a little baby. We went to Canada and went to all the national parks. I mean, we sort of left in the beginning of the summer and decided then... We formally didn't leave, I think, till when we came back, but we went on a, put up a tent, or learned how to put up a tent <laughs> in New Jersey, which we bought at a more sand store, and then we went up to the state, up the coast, up to Nova New Scotia. England, up to Canada, and we took a, probably a couple of months, and our, Michael was what, three, four, he was six months old, Gene was breastfeeding, and we just got away from it. And right after we left, one of the firms wanted me to come back for an interview, and I said, no, we didn't want to do that. But along the way, um, one of our colleagues, Terry Lenzner, um, who his book is going to come out, who also was at that point the director of legal services for the Office of Economic Opportunity for OEO. And they had started some legal services programs with OEO money there wasn't a lot of that going. Most of those programs were in the Northeast where state, at that time under the Office of Economic Opportunity Act, you could only get a project if the governor agreed. You had to, the state had to say okay for whatever happened. And so there were very few legal services programs outside of the Northeast California. So this, uh, Terry had been approached by some lawyers in Charleston who wanted to start a public interest law and were a public interest law firm focused on the coal issues, symptomatic issues of poverty in the coal fields. Mm -hmm. And so he we got in touch with us and said, why don't you go down and take a look at this? I would like, I'm willing to put a little money in starting supporting this kind of work in Appalachia. Mm -hmm. And so we came down, we stopped and visited with folks in Charleston, then we came down here and camped out here at Jenny Wiley State Park, put the tent up, and Gene said, you better see if there are any bears around, <laughs> and foxes. There wasn't anybody out there but us. I mean, it was, it was at September. the end of the season. It was the end of the season. Yeah. And I figured if there were animals, they were eating off the campers, <laughs> and there were no more campers then. <laughs> so we did, we were actually on our way to Florida. It was high holidays, mm -hmm. Jewish high. We were gonna go spend to, your folks and then to my parents who had retired to Florida. So we came down here and we interviewed Harry, saw Harry Caudill in Whitesburg who wrote Night Comes to the Cumberlands and was on, he was on the Apple Red board in West Virginia. They'd already started a little corporation up there. And, and just for the record, Apple Red stands for? Appalachian Research and Defense Fund. Mm -hmm. 
that that was the original name. Then several years later, when we had to split the programs because of political problems, I mean, we weren't welcome down here. Well, anyway, so we came here, and we... And here the, being... Prestonsburg. Yeah. We came to Prestonsburg. We came to Charleston, talked to the folks who were there that Terry had talked with. <clears throat> and then there were... There was some lawyers who were unlicensed who were already here, and a fellow named Howard Thorkelson. And Howard was going to leave, and they asked us to... Um, he was going to be the deputy for West for, for Kentucky. Mm. Anyway, so he was leaving. So we came he, to Prestonsburg and then drove down to Whitesburg to talk to Caudill and said, we think about it, and drove and uh, drove on down to see my parents and really thought, well, this, there, there are some real environmental issues, there are issue, poverty issues, there's certainly a lot of poverty, and there are very few lawyers who are going to, who appear to be available to challenge these. Most of these private attorneys were tied up by coal companies, mm -hmm. and the issues that were described to us by Harry, this broad form deed, and the environmental issues around strip mining and mm -hmm. coal mine health and safety, black lung, mm -hmm. um, and the poverty issues, consumer law, and they, there were a lot of, at that time, there were a lot of basic issues around food stamps and Medicaid. In the early parts of that program, applicants were given, a, had a difficult time. Just mm. local welfare offices were very niggardly and were not, I mean, what a they were a word to use. With N I G G A R D O Y. Anyway, they were, it was just, uh, how could your dad spelling? Oh no! They were just terrible. I mean, they, 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 you would think they were treating these applicants so badly, mm -hmm. and people were having a difficult time getting similar to food the stamp. registering to vote. Thing, yeah. Very yeah, it was very much Who's, the what same. What family you were? Who you got? And uh, jobs were all very political because mm -hmm. the coal. There were only two industry. The largest employer invariably in these counties was the schools was the coal companies, and the second largest were the school districts. And they were very politicized, and uh, they were as much of a fiefdom as mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. saw in the white power structure in, mm -hmm. the, in the South. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think, so you how, know... What, what was your uh, area that you, that you covered? From well, we area? started, I mean, technically the organization was for the Appalachian counties in Kentucky, of which there were 42, we, we eventually gave, gave away, gave, moved six counties into another legal services program, the ones around Ashland. But the program covered these 37 counties, and so when, when I first came, we had one or two, we had two, an office on the campus, University of Kentucky, one in Barberville, and here, we eventually, when the Legal Services Corporation Act was passed, and finally there was federal funding, mm. there was a lot of controversy about the legislation to create a structure for free legal services mm. programs. A lot of opposition. When we came to here, mm. there was a lot of opposition from the local bar yeah. because they thought we were taking money away from them. And the community because they thought we were communists. Well, and that too. Because our predecessors, they'd had a group of a group of Apple call of activist outside agitators. Call they were Appalachian volunteers who had come here to volunteer in various poverty programs, and they too lived with local families and encouraged them to apply for benefits and health care. I mean, the hospitals at that time were turning away people who didn't have any money. They just tell them we don't do we don't. Unwed, I mean, uh, pregnant moms couldn't get a delivery. A lot of terrible stories. Mm -hmm. um, and the si system the situation was really pretty grim. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, th and so these. It took a while to work your way into the. Well, I mean, there was a case that went to Supreme Court involving the Appalachian Volunteers, where the I think the one of the uh, volunteers had threatened a local official, or might have even. Slugged him. I can't remember. No, he slugged them. Well, I don't know. Clark, did he hit him? 
I can't there was remember. A, anyway, anyway there was just before we came. We there was just here. a lot of controversy, and they and that the uh, there was outside agitators in spades, yes. and they were trying to encourage people to apply for benefits and to get um, and that sort of thing. And there was health care was very was very poor. Yes. I mean, there were uh, one of our friends started eventually started a free clinic out here on Mud Creek, but there were all those issues that. Uh, if you were trying to promote social justice or environmental justice and make the system operate a little more fairly so that poor people have a chance and that it isn't just who you are, you, um, and that you have uh, so often at that level, a lawyer makes a big difference. Many of these people have legal issues, mm -hmm. family problems, disability problems. I mean. Disability benefits, consumer law. You can't. How can you deal with a foreclosure if you don't have a lawyer? So your plate has, I'm sure, in the 43 years has been full the whole time. I mean, especially covering such a wide area. Absolutely. What? Do you have a full plate? You. Well, we busy. have 10 off. We expanded to 10, 11 offices okay. from, and this was our main administrative office. Mm -hmm. And then we started back when I retired in 2002. We said we got, we we're fortunate we started a separate nonprofit to do primarily focus on the coal issues called the Appalachian Citizens Law Center. But over that time, when we expanded, we, each of these offices would cover several counties. We were hoping we would have four lawyers in every, at least in every office, so we could do the day to day work and do a major, a larger case. We sued the state, like we sued the state park system, because they were discriminating against blacks. Still couldn't get a job in the state park system. If you were black, primarily you'd end up at the bottom. That was familiar. We, but that takes a fair amount of resources. Sure. Locally, in a local little office, <clears throat> those. I mean, we did a lot of those fairly major cases and day-to-day -day divorces for people or custody matters that. All of them take time, and no private attorney is going to do them if you can't if they're not going to pay you. So, it uh, we have in my what I hope to do is have a first class law firm for poor people. The way John Doerr wanted to put a good bunch of lawyers together for to represent the government. So I think we did some of that. I think we are, had a wonderful, have a terrific group of lawyers who. Are, in fairly remote locations in small towns in eastern Kentucky, and so you came saw that as something you could do was to train that that next generation, the next cadre. I hoped it was a good goal. I think it, that's what I wanted to do, and you know, and hopefully these folks, when you are in the community, one of the big differences I do think is that I had learned to appreciate was that we were in the South and spent a lot of time preparing cases, but we went home to Washington. Mm. When you're here mm. and folks are in their communities, they also become part of the, system, the, the local community. Mm -hmm. So if our kids are in these schools, we care about these schools. Sure. And so Gene's on a statewide advocacy school. I mean, we've been working on education for many years, not just us, but what you want. You're trying to create a better community for everybody. And whether it's schools or the environment, and the environment is hard because coal miners want they, that's their jobs. And when people start complaining that regulations are preventing them from mining coal, mm -hmm. um, it makes it hard to try to justify to demonstrate that. You need regulations to protect the environment, and that that can be done. You can mine coal responsibly, yeah. and uh, and uh, comply with regulations at the same time. I mean that those you have to, if you're going to care about these mountains. Now, a lot of these companies or out-of-state companies don't care. For many years, all the coal underground was owned primarily by out-of-state interests, and they weren't paying any taxes on the. So we were able to get that's changed. About extraction industries, isn't it? Hmm? It's a strange thing about extraction industries. Oh yeah. An oil depletion allowance, for example, we'll let you take as much as you can out, and then we'll pay you a bonus for all the, that you've lost by having taken it out. Get a little extra. A little extra. 
Well, unfortunately, Kentucky and Alaska and some, <clears throat> some of the other states at least set up some trust funds and put away some money for later on when the extra, um, severance taxes and they've never the they have you we've have a severance tax here but most of a lot of that money was spent on roads and and economic development that didn't really pan out so they're and this is a very difficult period here I mean, it's not quite what we're talking about which is there isn't coal miners are losing their jobs mm -hmm. and no one has over time been able to demonstrate how to come up with other industries or other replacements. I mean, where it's a global competition, we've done things like get our little science museum started right yeah, here. We have a nice planetarium. Yeah. Hmm? I saw the signs for that as you were coming in. The, oh, yeah, we yeah, you saw the signs coming in. Yeah, it took about 10 years. We have a <laughs> very, I mean, the history of it is really the my growing up in Gastonia, where we now have a wonderful natural history museum. That was uh, the father, which was a scout executive I was with. But so we started talking about trying to do outreach to math and science and math and science in this region in our county because our scores were so low. The mm -hmm. students were doing badly, so badly, and I was hoping that we could get that if we get some brain power going early in math and science, we might be able to affect the future. Maybe some okay. smart kid will figure out how to do a <laughs> silicon holler instead of a, a silicon valley. Nice. So nice. we built a very nice, we were able, because the governor was from the next county and the speaker was from this county, we politically over a couple of legislatures, we got enough money together to build this very nice facility with a planetarium and a multi-purpose classroom and some exhibit space and that sort of thing. A really nice resource for a community this size. But there are other things going on here. There's a regrowth. And John was on the advisory board and I was on the advisory board for the local Job Corps Center. And I, we just want you to know, they also had a rocky start here, but yeah. they were very helped by citizens' involvement and stuff like that. Yeah. Job Corps Let important. me, um, I think, what's Bring this out. I'm going to ask Jean yeah. if you would sing us down, sing us out, uh, maybe we're with a uh, um, we're done. a concluding <laughs> no. a concluding statement of any kind. Sing what us out. What do you think? Well, we've had a very when we when you reflect on your life, mm -hmm. you feel very fortunate when your values are congruent with what you're doing day to day, and we've been able to do that. Thank you. For, Ta -da. And for the cha cha cha. Beautiful. <laughs> Great. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.